Hey friends, I'm Scott Hanselman. And I'm Maria Nagaga. And this is Microsoft Virtual Academy. We're going to be talking about ASP.NET Core 2. Yes, we are. All right. We've got three days of great content for you. This is the beginner day. We're going to have a beginner getting started, a little bit about .NET and C Sharp and the resources that you'll need. Uh, Maria and I will explore creating a web application. And by the end of these three days, you should be ready to go and make a, a, web, a web application for yourself. Exactly. And a good place to get started here is for people to figure out where to get the tools they need to get started. Yep. So if you go to dot dot net, we made a little fun domain for you here, dot dot net. Or if you go out there and uh, search with your favorite search engine for learn C sharp or download dot net, you will probably end up showing up here. The page might look something like this, might be a little different by the time you have, uh, by the time time has passed. But you'll click on download and you're going to see three different .NETs to choose from. There is the .NET framework that comes with Windows. There is Xamarin, which lets you make uh, iOS and Android and Windows applications. Uh, we're going to be focusing today on .NET Core, aren't we? Yes, we are. Uh, so if you click on that, it should show you a couple of options um, mm -hmm. on how to get started. And a lot of things that come up, especially for new people to our platform, is do they download the SDK or the runtime? Mm -hmm. Right. So the SDK, that's the tools, the compiler, the stuff I need as a developer because it's the software development kit. Yep. So you probably will never want the runtime unless you're going to put that into production. Uh, and then if you really want more information, you can follow step-by-step -step instructions down here at the bottom. Yeah, and we should actually click on one of those. Um, click on the Windows one, and you should see not only a step-by-step, -step, but mm -hmm. also a few videos in between. Right, so we've got a little video. This is very, very short, two or three minutes. Uh, not as fun as this video, but still. <laughs> uh, you download the .NET SDK. It'll pick the right version for you. And then by the end of this little three or four step process, you will have written your first .NET app, which I think we'll do in a little bit. All right? So you can also, of course, get your different versions of Linux. You can do it on a Mac. And you can also use Docker. So there's a lot of options. .NET yep. Core runs everywhere. Everywhere. And you can get this all run in 10 minutes. Or less, really. Well. So the other thing that you might want to think about is our documentation. If you go to docs.microsoft.com, and you'll get the country, your country of choice, this docs right here has got all the different docs through all the different Microsoft properties. So Azure and Xamarin and bots and all kinds of fun stuff. When you go to .NET, there's a ton of great things. And we're going to go through this a little bit more and show you some of the fun things inside. But remember, we're focusing on .NET Core, yep. C Sharp, and ASP.NET. That's what we're doing. All right. And the last thing that you want to think about is Visual Studio. And there are Visual Studio options. So you have Visual Studio IDE, which is on Windows, right? And mm -hmm. if you scroll across just a little bit, there's Visual Studio Code. Mm -hmm. And if you scroll just a little bit down onto the next level, you'll see the different options. So you have Visual Studio for Mac now mm -hmm. as well. Yep. And you can build your ASP.NET Core application there. So anything that we're doing today, people can do this on their Mac. Good point. So even though I'm on a Surface Book, I'm running Windows, literally every single thing that we're going to show you today, you should be able to follow along on your Mac, on your Ubuntu machine, on your Windows machine. Uh, I will be using Visual Studio Code a little bit. I'll be using Visual Studio a little bit. But you should be able to follow along in your favorite editor. All right? Yeah. Cool. We'll take a quick pause, and we'll come back with the next module. So let's build our first app. Scott, do you trust me? I do trust you. All right, okay. so I've installed the .NET Core SDK. I just downloaded this, and I went through the installer. So you've done this. So it's one of those things of like, we did it in the past. Well, how do I know it worked? OK, so go over to your command line. OK. And type .NET dash version. Oh, you already did it. OK, well, so I just typed .NET by itself. So it actually shows that it, it exists. Otherwise, okay. you would have got some error. That's a good point. And yeah. actually, I could type where .NET, and it'll tell me not only that it exists, where it is, but where it is on the disk. And you see it's in program files. OK. OK. So let's make sure that you're using the right version. Right. So we're in 2.0, so .NET dash version. OK. OK. And I got 2.0.2. You'll get 2.0. something. Yeah. And this is a, a patch version. It's like a, like some minor changes have happened. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But 2.0 is what matters. OK. OK. So I've done that. What else can I do? So uh, let's, so people are comfortable, let's do a .NET help, because it's always good for people to know that there's a place that they can go and see what's happening. So if you type .NET help, let's just see what happens. Right. So I can type .NET dash dash help, and 
any of these commands have help. Like there's help throughout the whole thing. Everything. So it tells you if you want to do something new, restore packages, run them. This is a good rundown of everything you need to know mm -hmm. that you can use with the .NET command. Now a lot of this might not be familiar, some of it might be confusing, but we're going to focus kind of on the basics and I think that making stuff and running stuff and building stuff is probably where we'll start for That's this. That's where we'll be right now. For this module. That's where we'll be right now. Okay. Um, one of the cool things, especially with .NET uh, 2.0, is the number of templates that have come out of the box in the command line. Okay, what is a template? So a template is, I think of it as a starting ground, something that gives you a form or a structure that helps you write your code eventually. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who are out there and you've used PowerPoint, and PowerPoint has different templates that gives you styles and guidelines, think about this as your PowerPoint for your code. Okay, so I've got console apps and web apps and test apps and all different flavors because oh, different kinds of apps which we will actually have a look at so should we go and see what kind of apps they give us all right let's do it so uh let's have a look at dot net new that's what i always type dot net new mm -hmm. all right and i get a nice and table and actually some stuff scrolled by so these are options for dot net new and it's worth pointing out that we've got help again which is actually help for new and this is a little an interesting thing to point out very briefly when I type .NET dash dash help, I get top level help. When I type .NET new dash dash help, I get help for new. That is actually the first time I've, I've done this all the time, but I've never noticed Isn't that. Isn't that great? Well, what's also interesting is if I type .NET new something, I can get the help for that template. Could you run that and we could see? So this is the console application template. Okay. And here's help options specifically for the console. And why this is useful is that let's say that I go and get a third party template, I get a template from somewhere else, that template might have a lot of complicated options and switches of its own. So .NET dash dash help is top level, .NET new dash dash help is help for new, and then if I put dash dash help for a specific template name, I'm going to get the help for that. Which is pretty cool. That is pretty cool. All right. I've literally found that out during this recording. See, and I'm <laughs> going to learn from you, and we're gonna, you're going to learn from me. We're going to have a great time. Okay. So I just went back to what you told me to do. I said .NET new. Okay. I see a list of templates, and I'll see a list of short names. Names. And you also see a different languages as well that are supported. Mm -hmm. right? And in this case, C Sharp is in brackets. That's indicating that it is the default. But we can also do F Sharp, which is a great functional language, or VB, which is a good language for beginners to try out. Okay. All right, so let's, uh, let's make one. Do you want to make a folder yeah. then? Yes, so let's make a folder. My console app. All right, so I have an okay. empty folder here. Exactly, and because we're going to build a console app, .NET new console. .NET new console, and a console app is one that just kind of in, in, in text mode here. Exactly. All right. so, so let's have a look at what happened when you type .NET new console over right. there. So it says the template was created. Successfully. And then it ran .NET Restore for me. So in the past, after I typed .NET New, I used to have to say Restore. What is it restoring? So it's restoring some of the packages, which we'll have a look at. What comes in there? Mm -hmm. And, and where the packages are those libraries, those dependencies, the things that it needs. To, to actually to be a console app. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then it generated a file, and it told me that it took a certain number of milliseconds. So we got a program.cs, mm -hmm. and we got a CS proj, or a C Sharp project. And the C Sharp project, is that's where all our packages are? That's where our references to those packages are. So if, let's go and just look at that. I'm just going to say type okay. and output that, because it's a very small file. It's really small. Mm -hmm. It says that it's using the .NET SDK, the Software Development Kit. It's an executable. And it's a .NET 2 app. And it doesn't have any, any dependencies beyond the basics. It does have some dependencies for outputting to the console and things like that. But for the most part, it includes the .NET SDK, and we have no additional references. OK. OK. So how do I uh, do something with this? Like, what does it actually do? Let's yeah, see so what that's the, what running. Code. OK. Here's the code. Uh, hello world. Pretty straightforward. So we'll do a quick run. Right. Is that OK? Yeah, that sounds good. All right, now there's a moment here, 1, 1,000, 2, 1,000, 3. Do you know what it was doing? Why did it take three seconds to say hello world? This is the first time you were running the application. It's got to build it, yeah. right? And, uh, but I've been doing this at the command line. We don't want to spend a lot of time at the command line. No. 
So shall we look at it at code? So we'll use Visual Studio Code. And it's worth pointing out if I zoom in down here that I've got both Visual Studio 2017, which yeah. is a Windows IDE, and I've got Visual Studio Code, which is a cross-platform IDE. Text so if editor. you're on a Mac, it's a text editor, it's a code editor. Yeah. It's a little bit less stuff, uh, but it's very lightweight, and it uh, is cross-platform, so we'll use that. Now, I'm going to type code dot. dot, and dot is the current folder. And uh, it's actually built in now, right? Correct? Yeah, I'll show you, actually. We'll go ahead and run that, and then there's a command inside of Visual Studio Code that adds it to the path. So it's something that you want to do after you've run code the first time. So we'll go ahead and run that. OK, and Visual Studio Code opens that up. And then this is interesting. Visual Studio Code pops up a warning here. Hey, stuff I need to build this is missing. Do you want me to add them? And then it's got a yes and no over here. So watch on the left side here where it says bin and obj. I'm going to hit yes, but you're going to watch here on the left. Oh, there it is. See? So this is just some stuff that VS Code created for itself. It's not about C Sharp. It's just about VS Code in order to be able to launch this app. These are just configuration files. So you don't need to worry about those, but that is something that you want to say okay. yes to. Right? So if someone's doing this for the first time, say yes, but don't touch? Don't touch. Don't worry okay. about it. Nothing you need to do in there. And then you had mentioned about the path. If you hit Control P, and I think it's Command P or fancy Macintosh button P <laughs> on a on a. Uh, it on is a Mac. Command P. Yeah. Command P, is that what it's yeah. called? Uh, there's a bunch of actions. So that brings up this palette. I just think P for palette. And then if you say, um, uh, what is this here? The greater than symbol? Yeah. I think it's called, is it add path? Where is it? There's a bunch of commands in here, and one of them adds code to the path. Maybe it's happening automatically now, but I did that once. You can see also here that there's other options like your color theme and you know the default shell and things like that. Yeah, and VS, the VS Code website has really good documentation about all the little bitty internals that are happening on their I, on the editor. Yeah, it's incredibly uh, easy to edit, to edit, to modify, to change the colors, the behavior. So yeah, feel free to explore. That's beyond the scope of what we're going to do. I'm just going to double click though on program dot. CS, and I'll zoom in a little bit. And we've got our application right here. And I think it's always good for people to play around with the console.write line, like put your name in it, run it again, um, remove the semicolon, and see what kind of um, errors you get. It's a really good way to get comfortable with the language. Mm -hmm. Now, I can make a change, yeah. hit Control S. I could Alt Tab back over to here, type .NET run again. Yeah. It'll build. There's that pause. Then it runs, says, hello, Scott. Then I could Alt-Tab back over here. But that can get a little tedious. Yeah. So is there something in Visual Studio Code that people can use now? Mm -hmm. Remember when I was over here, one of the options was Terminal Select Default Shell. Yeah. I can hit Control, and I think it's called the tilde. Yeah, that's tilde. You mean the squiggly thing? The squiggly yeah, thing? Yeah, it's a tilde. <laughs> I always called it the squiggly tilde thing until I started a documentation. I think our Spanish friends would not call it that. <laughs> but uh, yes, it's the, 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 the character that goes over the top of the enye. Yeah. So you hit Control tilde, and you can, of course, uh, select your shell. Select that your own way. You can pick your own shell. I'm using PowerShell in this case. Now I'm actually in a little command line prompt within Visual Studio Code itself. So now, rather than having to go and say, uh, can, you know, Alt Tab yep. and then do that, I can do it all from here. Okay. So there's my hello Scott right there. Okay. That's one way to do it. But still, I'd like to do some interactive debugging. I'd like to do something a little bit more sophisticated than that, wouldn't I? Yeah. So I'm just going to move the mouse over in the left here, and you see this red dot. Yeah, that's a breakpoint. Yep. I'm going to click on it, make a breakpoint right here. And then I'm going to go and click on the little bug. Well, that's uh, pretty um, intuitive, actually. I think so, because there's going to be bugs. I know that for a fact. <laughs> now, this text right here, this .NET Core launch, the way that it knows to do that is because I said yes earlier. To the launch. Thing. If I didn't say yes, 
I would not be able to do that debugging. Okay. Okay. And Visual Studio Code can do other languages as well, like Node and Python and things like that. So uh, that file will be different depending on what language you're using. All right. So I'll hit Start Debugging. And then it's going to go and build it. And it's thinking, and it's thinking. And there you go. So now we have stopped the application before we said hello world. We're just sitting right here. And I can hover over different um, variables. I can see if there's any local variables. Actually, we can do this real quick. Let's hit stop. We'll say var i equals Maria, var j equals nine. Hit debug again. See? Yep. And we've got debugging. You can look at our call stack. And you know, it's a whole interactive experience. It's pretty rich. It is pretty rich. It's Given that it is a cross-platform code editor, it's pretty fantastic. And it's also worth pointing out the not just the squigglies that it's giving us. If we look here, there's some warnings. Like as it's saying, well, you, you used I, but you never did anything with it. Yep. But also, uh, sometimes you can get uh, what's the word? Um, what is this here? What is that called? The light bulb. The light bulb. Mm -hmm. So I could go and say, I want to extract that method or remove that variable. Right? So you can do little refactorings. It's going and saying, well, really, this is used for nothing. There's no reason for that line to be there. And I can click on this, and it'll fix it. And in this case, it'll fix it by removing you entirely. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> that sounded rather. That was, not, that was not the intent. <laughs> All right. So Visual Studio Code will be what we'll use for a little while, and then we'll, we'll eventually graduate to Visual Studio proper, yeah. which has even more features. All right? So that gives you a sense of, oh, and actually, I'm sorry, we never talked about IntelliSense. Yeah, so uh, let's add a read line, because like, one of the first things that you do is input and output, right? Mm -hmm. So write line is our output. Yep. I'll start typing console, and you'll notice that it's some, yep, console. It's giving me IntelliSense. Not only it's also for beginners, it's great to see it also shows you what that means. Yeah, you're right? getting like a little bit of documentation there. That's right. That will say console dot. See, this is nice. And you said read line. See, and this is coming out of the docs here, and it'll tell you the things that could go wrong. Read line. Yeah, reads the next characters from the input stream, and then yeah, notice the squiggly. Yeah. Expected a semicolon. Go like that. Cool. And then I'll do this from, from the command line over here. I'll say .NET run, 1, 1000, 2, 1003. And now it's paused, right? Because it's waiting for me to read the line. Press and enter. Did. Okay. So you've got IntelliSense. You've got debugging. Uh, all of that, of course, being driven by this here. And just very briefly, because it's nice to see some of the internals. When we clicked here, remember that this, this text here, .NET Core Launch, comes out of this config file right here. Oh. Oh. Right? The reason that I'm showing you that is it's important to know that there's no magic. We're not hiding anything from you, right? You might not necessarily ever want to change that, but it's nice to know that the thing that drives the debugger underneath is just a text file. And here, it's going to go and run our program. When we say .NET run, our program is really here, my console app dot DLL, and it's going to go and call that. And then if we want to go and attach to the debugger, there's also the ability to run the app, and then after the fact, attach to it, and then debug it once it's already running. All of that is possible with, uh, with Visual Studio Code. I think it's also worth showing um, the audience where to go and read more about what's happening with Visual Studio Code. Mm -hmm. So Visual Studio Code is up at code.visualstudio.com. And there's a really rich marketplace as well uh, for extensions. There's lots yeah. of stuff. So you can use Visual Studio for C Sharp like we are, or Python, or C++, or Go, or a million different things. And their docs are really lovely. There's lots of different things you can learn about. You can change styles. You can change behavior. You can integrate it with your uh, source control like Git. You can, you can create your own 
extensions as well. Yep, there's a whole section here exactly on extension authoring. Um, I think my favorite extension would have to be the slides extension. Have you seen that slides? one? Slides? I like the one with the funky icons. So this <laughs> is, this one here like gives you fun icons for all of your and I, I think they've moved some of those experiences into actual mm -hmm. Visual yeah. Studio now. Some of these extensions yeah. end up becoming a part of uh, Visual Studio itself. So what's the one you like? Slides? Yeah. So you can actually write your PowerPoint slides. Um... Where'd it go? I don't know. Uh-oh. The one I like is GitLens. G-I-T-L-E-N-S. See, that's weird. Maybe their search isn't working today. They, oh, it's, it's actually Git Lens with a space in between. So Git Lens is a great one that lets you have annotations of who changed your code and when. Oh, OK. So it's similar to how you can do it in Visual Studio, where you can actually look at everyone. Um, yeah, like blame, if you want to see who, whose fault it was. So here you can see that it was Eric's fault two days ago, and he made a change from this to this. Yeah, I've seen your name on a couple of those, too. I'm kidding. Yes. I have not. Um, the, the one I was talking about is Reveal. 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 So if anyone's heard of Reveal.js, it enables you to actually you know, write, have a slight experience in the browser. So Yeah. So you've got the ability to edit Markdown and do all kinds that, of things. Exactly. So really can't recommend VS Code enough. But if you're just getting started like we are today, Visual Studio Code is going to be your best bet for your, uh, your editing and your debugging experience. Yes, it is. All right. Right. Take a short break, and we'll be right back. So we looked at how to build our very first console application. And one of the great things about the .NET community is about the documentation that we have right now. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of great docs. And I know it's silly sometimes to talk about how great the docs are, but really, the docs are very, very good. If you go to docs.microsoft.com, click on .NET, or you can go slash .NET, there's a ton of documentation here. There's the .NET Core Guide, which will have tutorials. It'll talk about ASP.NET Core yep. that we're going to talk about as well. And it's worth pointing out the difference between the .NET Core Guide and then the language guides. Yeah, and you'll see there are different language gu guides. We have mm -hmm. VB, we have C Sharp, we have F Sharp. Right, so these are the guides that will give you uh, understanding of the syntax of the language yep. and uh, how to call the methods, and then the .NET Core framework itself, and all of those methods are available from C Sharp, F Sharp, and, and Visual Basic. And it's really important for people to actually le learn the language a little bit more before they start looking at the platform itself. A absolutely, absolutely. And um, we did a Hello World. Yep. I installed the .NET Core SDK, and I ran it from the command line, and then I opened it up in Visual Studio Code. Do I have to install that stuff to say hello world? No, you don't anymore. Okay. We actually have something right in the documentation. If you go over to Quick Starts under C Sharp, so C Sharp, Quick Starts, mm -hmm. it will drop you right into the Quick Start page. And this shows you from the hello world experience, how to get started with numbers in C Sharp, declaring variables. It shows you some really fun examples that you can start playing around with. So if you. So I've got a .NET editor here yeah. in my browser. I'll so, go and copy. Console.writeLine yeah. line. Or you can just here. click on the copy as well. Okay, over click there. on copy, hit run. And now it's running in the cloud, and it brought the result over here. So the, the .NET SDK is not installed on my machine. No. It is, it is, it's happening right here. Exactly. And you can go in and edit that. Mm -hmm. and maybe so I can make changes to this kind mm -hmm. of code. I can do whatever I want, and then the output will appear down here. Absolutely. And I can mess with, look at this, I can do all kinds of fancy stuff. So if I bring in really complicated code, and mess with strings yeah. and do that. And then follow through some, with some uh, online challenges. So it's actually designed as a complete challenge that's supposed to take 28 minutes at the very most. Mm -hmm. um, step by step, gives you examples of what needs to be done. Mm -hmm. um, the editor that's working in the browser right now is in preview. So if people see any bugs, they're more than open. Ha we're really excited for you guys to give us any feedback there. Sure, and then you can report those on the, uh, yeah. on the GitHub repository. And speaking of GitHub, yeah. uh, in fact, all of .NET is open source, so it's important to remember that it, it is all on GitHub. So if you go to github.com slash .NET, github.com slash .NET, you'll come here to the .NET Foundation, and it is within there that all the source code is there. Now, as a beginner, you might not necessarily care about that source code, but it's just nice to know it's there. Yeah, and they also do have samples within mm -hmm. most of the repos that they can start playing around with. Actually, that is a good point. It's all there. You can go and look at the, uh, the core CLR, and the docs themselves 
are also open source. Yes, they are. So if you see any typos, if you see mm -hmm. any options that you'd like to look at, you could do that. So if you click on the edit mm -hmm. over there. So I'm here on, for example, getting started with .NET Core. Yep. And you said click on edit. Where do I end up at? Well, I end up at GitHub. Yep. So I can be a contributor to open source by even fixing a spelling error or changing a bit of code that might be incorrect. Exactly. All right. All of this is under the .NET Foundation GitHub. And you can also check out the .NET Foundation at .NET Foundation org. Oh, there you are. There you, I am. You just flew by there. So the .NET Foundation is a nonprofit, an independent nonprofit that tries to support the .NET ecosystem. All right. There's lots of open source projects that are within it. You can set up a local meetup or find a local meetup near you. We've got meetups all over the world. Wow, literally all over the world. And we really do, actually. And there is a, there's, a, there's one on every continent. And uh, you also have a, uh, a show called yep. Code Conversations. Yeah, the way thing about Code Conversations is it's five to ten minute videos that we sit down with engineers or people working in different open source projects, and they tell us a little bit of how to get started on that, that project. Mm -hmm. So you can check that out. That's on YouTube and also on Channel 9, which is our, uh, our TV channel. And uh, again, I want to encourage people to check out the meetups. There's about 1,200 different meetups locally, user groups, uh, not locally, rather, worldwide. Uh, you can learn open source. You can uh, sit and find friends to code with. You can pair up. You can do all kinds of things. And if there's no one nearby you, you could even potentially Skype people. That's actually a good idea, a I, Skype I meetup. I do that all the time. I have lots of different opportunities where I sit with people and learn code and, uh, and pair, but we do it remotely. Oh, and you can do that with Skype interviews as well. That's true. All right. So just a reminder, you can go to docs.microsoft.com, check out the quick starts to run your C-sharp programs in the browser. Also a great way to maybe introduce your uh, young people or new programmers to, uh, to coding in C-sharp. And then if you start at either GitHub or the .NET Foundation, you can jump off to all of these different locations. And then one other thing worth pointing out, uh, as I just saw it fly by, uh, was uh, .NET Conf. Yep. There is a lot that. of great content that came out of .NET Conf. Mm -hmm. This was a conference in 2017. And you can go and check out the sessions for .NET Conf up here at .NET Conf .net. There were 45 different sessions, about 45 hours of content that you can learn some of the more advanced techniques. Yeah, I'm So when you're done here at Microsoft Virtual Academy, yeah. you can maybe dig into that more advanced stuff. Exactly. All right. Take a quick break. We'll come back and make a web application. Yes, we will. Hey, friends. All right. So we have made a console app. Yeah. We have explored the documentation. We've installed the .NET Core SDK and Visual Studio Code. Yes. All right. Next, let's make a web application. Exactly. All right. So if we look at my screen here, uh, we have the folder that I have my console app. And so let's go. So we have to create a brand new folder. Right. I just yeah. want to point out that all that did was a right line, and it output it to the console. Not particularly impressive. There's no web browser. Oops. There's no web browser here. There's just hello Scott. Yeah. We need to like when when you're learning about a web framework, you want to know. You want to do something on the web. Absolutely. So let's I just do want to it. juxtapose the difference between the two. So let's take a look at that. All right. Yeah. So. What do you want me to do? So can I uh, teach you a new trick? Let's do it. That you can create your web application and a uh, directory at the same time. Are you sure? I can Because I you. like making directories. I know, I know. But like, try something new. Try All something right, new. Right. Okay. I'll try it. So .NET new web dash o. Dash o. Yeah. Mm. And let's call it my web app. So. We, in the previous video, we looked at the different .NET uh, templates that are available. Mm -hmm. Web is just one of the templates. So we looked at console, and mm -hmm. now we're looking at web, just for people who might be tuning in now. Okay. So hit Enter. So it says the template core empty being created successfully, and it put it in a folder called My Web App. So I like to go and make the directory, then go into the directory, and you're saying I can go dash O, It'll make the folder and name the thing all at the same time. At the same time. And if you think about it, if somebody's following this outside of Windows, the way they create a directory might be different. That is a valid point. You're right, because I said MD, and they might say Makedir, Yeah. and that's a good point. All right. And when I did that, just as you said, we did a .NET new web, yeah. which is this one. This is an empty one. And there's different web options that we'll explore later. 
but right now we made the the simplest possible exactly web just like the step just above a console right lane just okay. right above it so let's we can go into oops let's go into the my web app and i see a cs proj which makes no. sense i see a program.cs which i had before but there's something different. I see a startup CS and a www root. Now we could poke around here at the command line, but you showed me that VS Code is better. It, it's it's pretty good. It is better. So let's go into there. Now this is interesting, by the way. I typed code dot. It opened up my web application. It's worth pointing out that if you notice in the background there, it also opened my previous windows. Um, VS Code likes to put things back the way it was. Okay. Right, so it's restoring my session. I'm going to go ahead and close the console app from yesterday, uh, from earlier, and uh, we'll just say uh, there's that warning again. Required assets to build. It's totally okay to say yes because we want to be able to debug our web application. All right. So I noticed that you have a couple of things down there. Are those additional? Yeah, that's a great point. So down here, uh, I've got some extensions. These are like a little accordion extensions. If I want to play with Docker or if I'm going to be using Git. So Git Lens and Docker are extensions. If I click over here on the left, you can see my installed extensions and re recommended extensions. And uh, I could go and search for extensions here okay. as opposed to using the, the web. All right. Okay, so I was just moving them out of the way. All right, because I just noticed something different. So I was ans asking questions for the people at mm -hmm. home. Definitely useful. So let's just move that out of the way. Here we go. So program.cs, this is a little bit bigger yep. than it was before. Because it's bringing in a bunch of stuff that, if we looked at the previous one, where we pretty much only had using systems and maybe I.O. Actually, that's a good point. Let's open up C the CS Proj. Yeah. If you recall, earlier, our SDK was Microsoft.sdk, Microsoft.net.sdk. Yeah. Yeah. Here it is, .web. This is a web application. Uh, this, this is new, indicating that there's a folder called www root that we'll talk about in a little bit. And we have our first package reference, ASP.NET Core, specifically .all. So literally everything. Right. Now, it could in fact be listed one item at a time. ASP.NET's broken up into lots of different pieces. So it's kind of a cafeteria plan. Okay. This is a package of packages. So rather than having a list of dozens of different packages and having to pick ones I want, ones I don't want, this makes it much, much simpler. It just gives me everything by default. So for learning, it's easier. For getting started, it's easier. If you're familiar with ASP.NET, it's easier because yeah. everything you expect is there. And it's also, one thing I've also noticed is it is one version now. Uh, it is nice and simple. You just say, I want 2.0, and it brings in everything that hangs off of it. Off 2.0, right. okay. It's a, I call it a meta package or a package of packages. I like that term, packages yeah. of packages. Yeah, nice and simple. So if we go into program.cs, you saw before we had using system. Yep. And when we say using system, that was what allowed us to type console.writeline because system.console.writeline. But here, this is a web application, uh, and we have other stuff. We brought in some threading and some I.O. stuff, but this is the ASP.NET stuff that's added. What's worth pointing out, though, is our main here is different than our console main. Before, we had a console.writeline, and that was it. Yeah. And actually, you know, this is totally totally off script, which implies, of course, that we have a script, right? <laughs> I wonder if I could do this. Okay. I just have a main, and I've commented out all the web stuff. So what would happen? Let's find out. I wonder if it'll work. Remember, I'm going to type control tilde, or tilde, tilde? I think it's tilde. tilde. And tilde. I think if you say tilde, you might have an accent of some sort. I think it's, yeah. it would be an accent that is completely and totally incorrect. Yes. Yes. Okay, so it actually switched it over to a console application. Right. Well, it didn't really switch it over because it always was a console application. The oh, yes. idea being that <laughs> The idea being that they're the same thing, right? A, a .NET application has a main, yeah. a main entry point, and then it does some stuff. And I just wanted to kind of juxtapose that it can do some console-y stuff or it can do some webby stuff. So let's do some webby stuff. Like right. what, what would it look like out of the box? Yeah, well, that's a good point. So let's go back, .NET run this time, 
having changed it to say build web host. And it's going to run and build. And it says a couple of things. It's running in production. It's listening on localhost 5000. So we have started a little web server. Okay. Now it says listening on localhost 5000. Let's open up browser and let's localhost 5000 it. Couldn't you also just click on the link within the terminal? Yeah, that is, okay. a, that is a good point. I guess I could. <laughs> <laughs> or not. Or not. Okay. I don't know. Yes. <laughs> it should. It should work. So that's Hello World. That's Hello World, exactly. So where is that Hello World coming from? Where is where is that text? It's, there's a text itself. So yeah, let's find out. So let's follow it through. So build web host passes these arguments in and says dot run. What does build web host do? That's right here. Yeah. Looks like it creates a default web builder and then it says use startup. And, and then you can see here that the startup text here is in in blue. That means it's uh, it's not a it's a keyword basically. This here, this word startup, is telling it use this class. This class's name is not magic. No. If I changed it to foo, it would not. Well, let's find out. Let's go ahead and change it to foo. Hit dot net run. Let's see what happens. The type or name startup could not be found. Okay. But what if I change this to foo? There we go. Pause. Runs just fine. The point there being that the name startup isn't magic. It isn't magic. It does right. not have to be startup. No. Nope. What it's saying is that, again, if we look at the docs, and this is what's nice. Uh, with Visual Studio Code, it says specify the startup type to use to be used by the web host. So it's just saying go and use this class, and this class here that we called startup or foo or whatever has to just be shaped a certain way. It has to look okay. a certain way. So you could call it Beyonce. You could call it anything. You could, it, yeah. There has to be a Beyonce. <laughs> I'm afraid I should probably have a. But uh, we'll just have Beyonce without an accent, and it should work just fine. Beyonce should be a keyword, it a, reserved, a reserved it word, be. but it it's should. not, sadly. So this is an important point, though. It's saying use this startup type, and that startup type has to have certain methods. So Beyonce, in this case, has to have a method called configure okay. services mm -hmm. and one called configure. Okay. And that's the requirements for Beyonce in this context for the startup class. So what's going on in these? We've and got we have the nice little instructions at the top, which I've always appreciated. Yeah, I like it when templates include a little bit of yeah. instructions, a little bit of, uh, of comments. So this method gets called by the runtime, and it adds services to a collection called the service collection. And services are just stuff you might want to use later in your app. So it could be things like authentication. So using a service like Facebook or Google, like which we'll look at later dates. But mm -hmm. so if I just yeah, type services dot, you've got add authentication, add caching, add identity, add logging, add memory. You know, add whatever, and even things that don't appear, like you pointed out, like maybe Facebook authentication yeah. or different kinds of. Those are all other third-party things that could be added on as well. So those services get configured here, get added to this uh, collection. Yep. And it's a little confusing because you've got configure services. And then you have configure. And like configure. that is something that confused me when yeah. I first started. It is confusing. This is the get everything ready, load up the collection of stuff I want to play with, yep. and then configure them, set them up. Mm -hmm. like, you could have maybe maybe they could have named it like add services, or you know do the stuff with the services <laughs> <Okay>. and then <laughs> configure them. But yeah, okay. the point is that one is prep your environment and then do specific things to set your environment up. Like uh, in this case, if we're doing development, not production, 
then when you get an exception, you'd like a nice, friendly page. Okay, not a page of horror. Yes, not the, the scary page. This here is uh, the app run. This is the default, because you said we wanted to do empty. And you asked where Hello World was. And there it is. There it is. So we've changed that text. And .NET run. It should still run. Now if I come back over here, notice it still says Hello World. Yeah. That's because we haven't hit refresh. And there it is. Oh, yeah, that's a good one. You like that? Yeah. Excellent. I think the beehive would be happy. They would be. All right. Cool. This is cool. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that when you are working, so we've seen Hello World or like Hello Beehive um, in honor of Beyonce, but as a person who's building their web page for the very first time, you want to see a page. Like you actually want to see something that's a little bit more than just a string. Just a string. Right. So and certainly you, having a string, like doing all of your work inside of a response.write is going to break down pretty quickly. Yeah. Right. So in the next section, we're going to go and add some pages and build, take this, and we're going to start from empty though. Yeah. We're not going to cheat. We're going to build on top of empty. So we've seen a console app. We've seen an app that does a single string. Next section, we'll do pages. Yes, we will. So we're back, and we're going to be looking at pages. In the previous module, we looked at you know building our very first empty web application, but it didn't really do much, right? Nope. It just returned a string. And when I think about building a page, I don't know if you think about this the same way. I, I actually think we do. Want, I want to see some HTML. I want to see a, a physical page structure. And if you actually go back to the project folder, like all the files that we have, mm -hmm. I don't see a single page. Right. This is not page focused right now. No. It's string focused. And while I could go and maybe, you know, boldface Beyonce, it's going to break down very quickly. Yeah. So this is we, we need a page focused framework. We do. And uh, just to bring it back even a little, just a little bit more, you talked about configuring services and configure. Mm -hmm. And we're going to configure our first service here. Right. Yeah. So if you type service.addmvc. So if I type services.add, I get all these choices yeah. that we saw before. And these are all the different things that can be layered on top of our application. Yes. And it's important to, to understand, like we talked about before, when we pop back out to programs, this is just a main. Remember, we did a, we did, we, we did a console app a second ago, but we're building up this pipeline of services. So what yeah. service do you want me to add? Um, MVC. So so add should... MVC. So this is going to add all the model view controller services that I would potentially want to use. Exactly. Okay, now I added it. There was a squiggle, and then the squiggle was gone. Did it just magically become an MVC app? No, because remember, we configure our services, mm -hmm. and then we need to configure. So we actually have to use it. We have to use them. We add yeah. them, and then we use them. Yeah. Okay. So the app use MVC. And I don't think we need... It's worth pointing out all the different use stuff. A lot of them. There's your Facebook, mm -hmm. your Google your different, what's called middleware. You'll hear about middleware during the advanced stuff, but this is where we're making some middleware right now. There's two options there, the default route or the regular use MVC. We're just going to say use MVC by yeah. itself. And there's a bunch of options you can pass in. We'll talk a little bit about routing later. So I say use MVC. So now MVC's in the pipeline. Yeah, so we can start taking advantage of it. I don't think you would need the last lines, though. Well, let's find out if it okay. still runs. All we've done is add MVC yeah. and use MVC. Does Hello Beehive still happen? Yes, it and does. now it's bold because I bold-faced it. <laughs> okay? All right. So that points out that it, it, it's, in, it's in the pipeline, but it didn't change the behavior of anything. Yeah, because it hasn't been used at this well, point. Well, we haven't added any pages. Yeah. Okay. So uh, I do not think, since we're going to be using MVC, I don't think we need app run anymore? Mm -hmm. I want to keep it in there, though, okay. if you don't mind, because when we add our pages, yeah. I want to see the relationship between this, which is now called the default route. Okay. The default route. This is the thing that happens if this doesn't happen. Okay. In the sense of it runs in order. Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah. So let's see, let's do the pages you want to, you want to add and see if, if um, 
if, if Beyonce shows up randomly. Yeah, and you mentioned something uh, pretty significant for a lot of newbies, is that the order in which your code is written matters. It very much does, especially when you're adding and using things uh, in certain order. I believe that if we went and moved MVC down here, we would have a very different experience. Exactly. And we can maybe experiment with that once we add a few pages. Yes, let's add that in. OK. OK. So first thing I want to do is add a new folder. All right. Yep. So I'm over here in uh, Visual Studio Code, and I can right click and say new folder, or I can click these buttons. I'm going to right click and say a new folder because I have found that depending on what's currently clicked on, when you say new folder, you might end up somewhere else. It can sometimes be like one folder down. So you just got to watch out for that. So I'm confirming that my pages folder you had me add is at the same level and not like accidentally in dub dub root or in somewhere bin else. or wherever. So it can be a little confusing. All right, so I have a pages folder. Okay. And now we actually have to need to add a page. So if you write a new file, and we're going to add a index.cshtml. C sharp HTML. Yeah, so I always call it C sharp HTML, but I was told that that wasn't right. It's not. <laughs> yeah. It's just a razor page. It's just a razor page, yes. OK, ignore that extension. OK. That so clearly says CS HTML. Exactly. OK. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It does. Uh, so first thing we want to do is add a page directory. So it would be at page. OK, so at page. So a directive starts with at. Yeah. OK. And we'll be seeing a couple of those throughout the day and seeing what you can do with that. All right. And we're just going to write some HTML. So let's just use a um, H1. OK, H. Oh, I get IntelliSense, which yep. is nice. Mm -hmm. Hello, Beyonce. Cool. Imagine if Beyonce actually learns how to code on one of these videos. And I don't have a, um, a fancy keyboard. You want to make sure you. I've got a respecter. You got to respect the bay. There we go. That's she will appreciate, appreciate that? that when one day when she does watch yeah. this when video. When she does watch this when and she invite does me watch to her house video. for lunch. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. Do I need to do anything else? Yep. Did you save it? Yep. So let's just see what happens. Let's run this. All right. Do do do. Gonna go and run it. It's gonna fire up localhost five thousand. All right. Wow. That's interesting. So index.cshtml appears to be the default. Yes. And um, I wonder if I changed its name. OK. Let's give it a try. And then just hit refresh. No, you'd actually now have to. No, look, where's that string come from? Oh, it came from mm. line. Go back. Yeah, it came from line 31. Right. So the point here is that use MVC added some default routing, some behavior. When yeah. you say routing, it's like when the URL comes in, it has to make a decision about who's handling this. Exactly. So if you went back to your, your page and you did slash Fred, would it pop up? Ooh, that's a good question. Slash Fred. Yes. yes. OK, so now we're starting to learn a little bit about the behavior. So by default, just because it's called index, mm -hmm. some magic, not magic, mm -hmm. with MVC defaults it as, the, as a default route. Right, right. OK, so if we added another page, and maybe we're going a bit too crazy here. Mm -hmm. Want to add another, name, another named page? Page, yeah. OK, uh, what do you want to call it? Solange? Yeah, or Rihanna, or as you know, whatever you want. All right. So, okay. So here's another one. This page is at. I'm thinking it's at slash Solange, right? Solange, right? right? Yeah. Okay. So we'll just put that in a paragraph tag to be correct. Oops. See how Visual Studio Code is trying to be helpful. I should have just opened up my, uh, my P to start with. There we go. Okay, so if you. So there's our default. Oops, did I not run it again? I don't think you did. Okay, so we done and run.
So there's our default. And that one is not showing up. It is not. Why don't we put it in a folder? Within a folder? Okay. And then call it index. So it would have to be Solange slash index then? No, because index is the default. Hmm. Interesting. Hello, beehive. Okay. So let's think about this. This. Okay. What are we doing wrong? This is good though because we're we're doing a. We're doing an experiment. Doing an experiment here, and in the process, we are uh, learning how things work and uh, doing things wrong. Right? We're going to do things together. So I've just changed that real quick. We did Fred before. Yeah. Oh, I know what it is. Tell me. All right. Check this out, friends. Let's go back and put it back to Solange. This is, okay, so here's index. Yeah. Look very carefully. There's only a couple lines. Yes. Here's Solange. We did not put the page directive. Yay. Uh, okay. Interesting. Interesting. So it is that that makes it magic. Exactly. That's when it runs. If it doesn't see the page directive, then it's never going to... Doesn't know where it needs to go. Doesn't know, it's not going to work that way. So that's interesting. Did not know that. Well, and I knew is, it, but I didn't, like, I knew it intuitively. But this know? is something that someone at home is going to encounter. Yeah, yeah, It's it definitely is. something that's going to, that you're going to encounter. Like, we hit it, and it was the first thing I told you to do, was to add mm -hmm. a page directive. Yep, absolutely. And, and this actually brings up an interesting point about Visual Studio versus Visual Studio Code. Yeah. When we switch over to Visual Studio Code later, we're going to end up uh, using the templates that are built in. So we're going to go and say, file new razor page. Exactly. And we'll get some stuff for free. Because we're just making these text files by ourselves, we bump into these kind of mistakes. So that's really interesting. That does bring up the question about the folder thing, though. Yeah. Why don't we try that? OK. Let's make a folder. Just call it folder that, and then we'll move this here. Exactly. And then change it to index which appears to be the default. So if you refresh the page. Yep, same, okay. ex same, same experience. Print. But if I change it here, so let's just explore this for a second. It looks like that is not necessarily the name of the file, but the path. So your default route would be path, and then another path, in this case, the default page right there, you see? Yep. So the route is the file structure, then. Mm -hmm. The route is the file structure, which, for a page-focused framework, is a really nice experience. It, it makes total sense for me. Right. Like, when you build your first HTML page ever, it mm -hmm. has the same experience. You have that page within a folder. Mm -hmm. And that means that when we go later on and make customers and products and things like that, it's going to be really clear about how to, uh, how to do that. Now, this is just static HTML, yeah. though. We should probably add something dynamic before we move on to the next section. So let's give Solange some more information. So I hear she has a concert today. OK. Let's assume that it's always now. There's always a Solange <laughs> concert always a Solange. at any moment. Exactly. So we'll have a bold face thing, and what should we say? Uh, the Concert starts at, uh, I don't know, 3 p.m., right? But I want to have that be dynamic. Okay. How can I make that now? At date time. So I say add again. Yep. Date time, which is like system dot date time. Dot now. Dot now. All right. Come back, hit refresh. Let me hit refresh again. I'm late. I got to go. You got to go. It's happening it's immediately. It's happening right now. Now, it's important to point out that notice the difference between me making a change. Yeah. Control S, Alt Tab, Refresh. I'm not having to build. No. Right? With Razor Pages, 
the page is being built when it changes and hit, it gets hit for the very first time. If I change the C-sharp files, I need to then go and rebuild. Okay, but within the page itself, mm -hmm. you do not need to do that. Okay. So the, the, the Razor pages, these, these CSHTML pages, they get copied to the host and they are part of the source code. But these .cs files don't get copied to the host. In fact, the DLL that they build into does. Okay. Right, and that's just a little important thing to point out. And you can see that if you go and say .NET build, we've been saying .NET run. Yeah. See? See how it actually points to your web app. It says, my web app is right there. Right. So right. I have a question for you. Of if course. someone on this, uh, who's watching us right now, mm -hmm. is like, what is that DLL thing that he's talking about? Where can they learn more about that? Right, so that's called an assembly. It's a dynamic link library. Yep. If you want to learn about the details of how assemblies works and things like that, you can go and take a look at some of the intermediate sections in the docs. Okay. Okay. But I just wanted to point out that when I go and publish my application for the like I'm, I'm meaning to say, it's time for my app to go out into the world. We're going to get. Uh, and just to be clear, for some people who might who are watching this, pu publish here doesn't mean necessarily mean that you're going to hit .NET publish and somehow it's going mm -hmm. to magically appear on the right. website. Right. Yeah. Like I just mean that I need people to understand the difference between the source code that's in their C sharp files yep. and the Razor pages. Okay. that are going to be copied up to uh, the, the, the final location. Cool. So this is a little bit of C-sharp right here. It is. Right. I wonder if I could cheat. How much do you want to cheat? Well, like, like we can write C-sharp here, right? Can I say 2 plus 2? What, like, what am I allowed to say in there? Broke it. Right. So that got an error, right? So, you know, it doesn't like, it doesn't like that. What are, the, what are the rules about what you can put in there? We will kind of explore that a little bit later as we can say at and then put chunks of code. Okay. All right, cool. So that is dynamic. There's a concert starting immediately. And uh, then we'll come back in a little bit and look at configuration. All right. Hey friends, we're going to talk a little bit about configuration, but before we do, briefly, uh, I got an error before and I want to fix that. Okay. And it was kind of annoying. I was goofing around here, if you look at our razor, and this is incorrect. I was being silly and goofing around. And when I was trying to do some math inside of my razor page, because I'm experimenting, yeah. I kept getting this 500 error. This is the kind of error that you get in production. Yeah. And it's annoying and it's scary. But it's not really helpful to me, is it? No. Well, remember, I'm running in production right now because we, uh, over here in, in startup, we said, if environment is development, show this developer exception page. You're going to show me later how to change from development to production. But I just wanted to briefly show that, of course, I can comment things out, just yep. like before when we commented out uh, starting a web app and instead changed it back to a console app. What I want to do is make sure that this developer exception page. You want to see it, right? I want to see it because I want. I don't want a 500 error. I want a real error. Okay, so I want to know what's going on. So by removing that line, you should be able to see the mistake. Right now, the right thing to do yep. is to switch to development mode. Okay. But we're going to see that a little bit All later. Right. Okay. Now I'll go back here. I'm going to hit refresh, and now I'm getting a development page. You don't want to see this in production, but it's showing me that well, this is not valid. This is not valid razor. And it gives me the line of code. So now I actually know what's going on. And I'll go back over here. Could you go back to your sure. error page? Um, if you hit on the plus button. Okay. Okay. It'd give me a little context. Of where it is where on it the is. page. Because okay. if it was thousands of lines, I might not know exactly where that was. Good point. All right. So instead of doing my 2 plus 2 there, I'm going to say at, and I'm going to open up a little block here. And we'll just make a variable like i. I'll do my 2 plus 2, and then I'll say I, you know, PM. OK. Make sense? So if I made a mistake in here, yeah. forgot to put the var. It should get into an error. It should say I does not exist and tell me the line, right? So it's compiling that that razor page the second that I hit refresh. 
All right. Interesting. Mm -hmm. So good reminder. Also, it is a good reminder. So I'm just goofing around there. Uh, what we'll learn about a little bit later is how to set this environment so that it is in development, so I don't have to comment that line out. So out of curiosity, this isn't something that people would want to do in practice, would they? Like by injecting bits of C Sharp everywhere into their code? Well, it depends. That's a good point. So we'll talk a little bit when we get uh, a little farther on to the day about the responsibilities of a razor page yep. versus the responsibilities of the, the page model or the code behind. Yeah. Okay. Okay. It is okay to do calculations in what's called the view if they are view based calculations, if there's stuff that's not business logic. Like okay. for example, I don't think I would want to calculate tax rates and shopping cart no. values in here no. from a responsibilities perspective. But uh, certainly I can chop up strings and do different kinds of stuff. So it is okay to inject uh, little bits of C sharp in here. Okay. It's more about is it going to be um, maintainable All right. for the rest of the team. All right. Cool. So we talked earlier, you had me uh, talk about the difference between configure services and configure. Yeah. I'm afraid we're going to insert another word that sounds like configure. I know. <laughs> it's just like it's configuration, configure, configure it more, and configure it a little bit more. That is software engineering, isn't it? It's yeah. mostly configuring things and running things. Yep. Okay, and they all so, have around the same names. So, yeah. so this module's configuration. What are we configuring <laughs> in this context? So we want, I want to show you how to add configuration into your application. That means like switches, options, things that you would, uh, configuration for your app. Yes. That is different from setting up your services. Exactly. Okay. All right. So uh, if you open up your, are we in startup? Yes, we are. We in are. startup. We call it Beyonce, which is probably going to confuse people. I know. Okay. Yeah. Should we still call it Beyonce? We should probably change it. Just change it back to startup. Us. Okay. We don't want to lose our jobs. Startup. Okay. We're in the startup class. Yes. Cool. And uh, we want to pull information out of a config file. Yes, right? we do. Where, where is the config file? In iConfiguration. No, but the name, the, the, the file itself, the settings for the application. Oh, you actually have to add, you, you mean you add your app JSON? Is that what you're looking for? Your app at? settings, yeah, right. So let's do that first. So app settings dot JSON. That's the default yes. name for settings for your app. Exactly. Now, I can put anything in here, right? As long as it's JSON, it's totally up to you know, whatever configuration information I want, exactly. right? Exactly. So we'll have like some message. Yeah, it can be like um, friendly call from Beehive or hello from Here's config. some, oh uh, yeah, here's a greeting. From the config. And your configuration, it really can be anything that is application specific. Any name value pair. Exactly. So you could have logging over there as well, could you not? Yeah, we'll see a little bit later we'll have the, the logging levels. Uh, it can be, uh, there'll be a place to put connection strings and all kinds of stuff. And we'll talk about the differences between where user secrets go, where connection strings go, and where non-secret things go. So um, just for reference for people who are going to be watching this, like when I've been using the app settings, I've been using it mainly for configuration of my database. Okay, so it depends on whether the configuration for your database is a secret. It's a secret. Or not. It should be a secret. Yes, it you should probably be a shouldn't put your it connection should not be in there. there. So do not do this. Um, <laughs> although it's defaulted in the template, but as someone we'll take who, a look at the template. <laughs> yeah, but as someone who has put apps into production, what are some of the most common things that you have actually used something like this for? Um, so uh, let's 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 say like uh, you know maybe like someone's email address okay. you know for like, or I might have uh, if I'm writing a blog uh, number of posts on home page. Okay. Ten, you know whatever. It yeah. could be anything that is a quick little switch or change that you might want to pop into a config file and update. Okay. And what's nice about configuration is it's configurable. We're using JSON. It could be an INI file. It could be an XML file. It could be a database somewhere. Yeah. Uh, any of the kinds of options that you want, you know, show ads on home page. You know, I'm just thinking about things that I do on my blog. Okay. That kind of stuff. Because I think people see it and they're just like, what is that about? And yeah. I think it's important well, to Showing message is a, is a silly kind of generic yeah. kind of a thing. But, yeah. But um, Like these are some real world yeah. examples. Like if you're having paging, you know, page size, you know, before I hit next, next, or yeah. whatever. So if I have 100 blog posts, maybe my page size is going to be 10. These are the kinds of things that you want to have 
in a config file somewhere that you can then pull out in your code. So we're going to figure out how to pull that out. Okay. All right. So let's go back to startup. And configuration is a service. It's yes, a, it it's, is. A, it's a thing, like logging is a service. You had MVC as a service. So we need to make sure that we can uh, uh, inject that service. That's a dependency that we're going to inject into our system. Okay. Uh, dependency injection, how much do you want to talk about that? Um, we're going to talk about that a little bit more in a different one. Okay. Yeah. So for now, we will just assume that uh, we'll give you a little bit of background, yeah. but we'll get deeper into it later. So I'm going to just make a constructor. Yep. Right, my startup constructor here. And whatever parameters the startup constructor has will be given to me automatically by the system. They'll be injected directly into the system. So I need the ability to have an I configuration. And this is a little trick here. Let's watch this is very careful. I'm going to type I configuration, and at the end of it, see how it's all squiggly? Yeah. I'm going to hit control dot. And it gives you the options. And it says, well, do you want to make one of these? Or is it the one, is, do you mean this one here? We mean that one there. Right. And there's actually two options. You can add the using statement. OK. Or fully, In, yes. fully express it, almost like a path, like C colon backslash, whatever, whatever, whatever. It's that a would, full path to I configuration. That wouldn't make it available to the entire program. And it would, we'd have to do that every single time we yeah. used it. Exactly. Good point. So we'll say using, and then watch up here on line 8. So watch at line 8. See? Ta -da. So yeah. it just drops in there automatically. So startup, our startup class, is going to need I configuration, and we can call it whatever, call it config. It can be, mm -hmm. And then we are going to store it away because they're going to pass it into us. They're going to they're going to make one, and this is important. We'll talk about config. We'll talk about dependency and injection later, but the part that you need to remember is that you don't need to make one. You just ask for it, and by asking for it, we put it in as a parameter. So we don't actually go and say new whatever. So I'll say public I configuration. And we can name it configuration. Yep. And this is going to be a property. Yep. So we have a get and a set. Get and a set. Excellent. And then we just squirrel it away, as they say. Configuration equals config. So they pass it in when we start up, and we stick it over here, which then presumably means I can use it, right? Yes, you can. So you should be able to use it right from your page. I can use it wherever. It yeah. should be sitting around. So I could be down here. Oops. I was going to say this dot configuration dot. And then those are all the things that one can do. Now that's within my C sharp application. My C sharp, uh, excuse me, my C sharp code, my startup.cs. But if we go back over here, let's go to our index one, our Beyonce Razor page. You said I can use it from within here yes. directly. But we need to inject it first. Ah, OK. So just like it was injected in, it was made available. Mm -hmm. Inject is an, kind of an intense word. I know. That, you know. I asked for it, and they gave it to me. Yes. I think inject is a little intense. Please? I don't know. So I'll say h2, h2. Can I just go and say config? No. Can I say mm. at config? Yes, you can. At configure, yeah. But I can't because it hasn't been injected yet. No. You actually have to have at inject configuration. OK. So up here where it says page. Yeah. We need a new directive. We need another directive. Mm -hmm. We need to go inject. OK. And then when I say I configuration, though, it's not going to work. Yeah, because we still need to inject the using statement. We have to add the using statement. So using. And we'll make and we'll later later on we'll see how to do this for every page instead of having to do it on one page. But I'm going to say using. Then I'll say inject i configuration and we'll just call it configuration. So this is asking for it. Yes. Okay. And then down here, I could say configuration, and we called it. We called it a whole bunch of things. Let's say message. Okay. We'll grab message. Because it's just a bag, a bag of stuff. Oops. I can do it on multiple lines. I'll do it on one line. 
All right, let's see if that breaks. That's my positive attitude speaking. Keeping it real. Yep. Let's see if that breaks. That's the attitude of the developer. I think it'll be okay. Breaking things is fun. Then you get to fix them, right? That is true. So that's our Solange page. Let's look at our home page. Here you go. Here's a greeting from the config file. Let's go back and change that. To another greeting? Yep. Right, so that's coming out of that config file. We changed the config file and the and the value the value changed. We did not change the code. All right, that's yep. pretty cool. It's worth pointing out a couple of things though. First, we have a using statement in our razor page, just like we did over in our CS. I wonder, could I do this? It should be a dot, right? Right. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So a fully, fully qualified path. Yes, it, it worked. worked. It did not. Well, it worked in that it didn't break. Okay, it, it worked. <laughs> I, yeah, it, it worked, worked in quotes. So that's interesting. I can back out of that. Uh, and then I later on will see how we could make that configuration available everywhere. Yes. Because I don't want to have to keep adding. Because otherwise you'd have to add it to every single page that you have. Well, yeah, and I've got three lines of directives here, and I've only got two lines of HTML. So that's no fun. No. Okay, so I think uh, we'll take a break and then we'll graduate to Visual Studio proper. Yes, we will. Very cool. Hi, and welcome back. We're going to have a look at Razor Pages in this model. We had a look at it a bit before where we introduced you to the concept of a page, and now we're going to have a look at it outside of Visual Studio Code and the command line. We're going to get started in Visual Studio. Right, so we've been doing our stuff in Visual Studio Code. You can see here we goofed around a little bit and we made a couple of pages. You'll remember, though, that we started from an empty template. Yeah. So we went from nothing. We went from a Hello World console app uh, into something with pages. I'm going to close Visual Studio Code, and I am going to go out here to Visual Studio proper, Visual Studio for Windows. Yep. You might be on Visual Studio for Mac, uh, if you're on a Mac. And in this particular case, uh, I'm going to be using Visual Studio 2017 Community. Yeah. You can go and get this at uh, visualstudio.com. For free. For free. Works just nice. Uh, it's great. Uh, Visual Studio community has a couple of small restrictions uh, based on the size of your company. But if you're doing this as an open source person or as a person who's learning, Visual Studio community is effectively pro. It's effectively okay. the pro version. It lets you have extensions. It's a great little tool. All right. So what I want to do is uh, you can see, just to familiarize yourself with the uh, the UI here. I've got some recents and things. Uh, I've got a new project. You can say create new project. On the left hand side, you may see different stuff depending on what you installed. When I ran the installer for Visual Studio, I set up for the web for workload. It's called the workload. Uh, you might have Android, you might not, but you want to make sure that you have the .NET Core web workload. And quick question, you mentioned the, web, the Visual Studio installer. That does come when you download Visual Studio. Yeah, so Studio. when you install it, good point, let me bring that up. When you install it, uh, you're going to get this application. This is Visual Studio installers coming up here, one moment. And the installer is modular, okay? So it'll come up like this. And if I say modify, you can run the installer multiple times. You can run the installer after you've installed Visual Studio if you wanted to add other stuff. Oh, see, look, even the installer itself wants to update. So right now, just coincidentally, the installer has new stuff but, okay. that it wants to give me. So it's going to go in and update itself. While it's doing that, you download this thing called a bootstrapper. It's a tiny little installer that goes and gets the things that you want. Visual Studio could be quite large if you installed everything. Or it could install in 20 minutes if you just wanted to do web apps or you just wanted to do Windows apps. So this allows you to customize your install. Exactly. And the things that you customize them with are called workloads. So like the cloud workload or the mobile device workload. So here, there you go. It just updated itself. You can see that I have, uh, at the time of this recording, Visual Studio Community 15.4. You should make sure that you have at least that or higher. If I click on Modify, it's going to go and give me some more choices. And I'm doing this, of course, after the fact. 
I picked Universal Windows, I picked .NET Desktop, I picked ASP.NET. But you can see so many other options. You have Python, Node, mm -hmm. Data Science. And I could add these things afterwards. So if I wanted to do Linux development in C++, I would click that, and it'll go and update and tell me, right now it's thinking about how much more it needs to download in order to get me that stuff. And then from within that, you can go into individual components and pick on the specific things that you want, right? So you see I've selected F sharp as well. This can be run multiple times, uh, and I just wanted to point out that uh, I ran it and installed the web workload. So installing the web workload when I went file new project is what gives me this choice here for saying web pages. So Visual C Sharp, web pages, and I've got the uh, ASP.NET web applications using the .NET framework, the mm -hmm. full framework that comes with Windows, or ASP.NET core web apps which work on, of course, Linux and Mac and Windows, which is what we're doing today. All right? All right. Good stuff. So I'm going to double click on that. I've said file new project, and it's going to pop up a dialog here. You're going to want to double check this drop down. You might have it default to like core 1.0 or 1.1. You're going to want to be 2.0 or higher. You'll notice that the icons change based on what you pick. I can make Angular apps or React.js apps. I can make full model view controller applications. We're just going to say web app, which is the default. Okay. This gives us both Razor Pages that we're doing today. And of course, Razor Pages are a part of or built on top of model view controller. Okay. So it's really the best choice for everybody, the, 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 the most recent project template. And if you were doing that from the command line, do you remember what the command was for that? Um, razor. Dot .NET new, new Razor. razor. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so I'll double click on that. And when we create that, we're going to watch the right-hand side over here where it says Solution Explorer. This will get you the same output as if you had said .NET New Razor. This is important that .NET New Web or .NET New MVC. It's the same experience. It's the same experience. You don't want to have a different experience for Visual Studio Code people than you do for Visual Studio proper people. So the templating does match because in the before you had to use a bit of Yeoman over in one place. Right. All the templating is matched and is nice and clean. There's a little uh, helper page that shows up there, but we're going to zoom in over here and see how Visual Studio for Windows expresses itself. You can see we've got a couple more pages than before. We've got an about page and a contact page. And where would those, where would those paths be, given what we learned about Razor paths? Slash about, slash contact, slash error, slash, oh, index would be default. Index would be default, exactly, right? Now, interestingly, these have something underneath them. Yeah. So these are the code behinds or the page models. That's the page and that's the page model and they've nested those. This is an important little thing to point out. If Let's look at this in Windows Explorer just to make sure. If I say open in Windows Explorer. They should appear as two separate files? They are two separate files. So here's index and index CSHTML. They are clearly two separate files. But it's kind of convenient and it gives you a sense of the relationship between the files that the Solution Explorer in Visual Studio will go and nest them. So could you think about it as the car and then the engine? Yeah, you could do that. Anything that is any kind of hierarchy. Yeah. And then beneath that .cs, it gets even more interesting. It turns into a class explorer. Okay. These are not files, of course. That's a property and that's a method. But now we're kind of blurring the lines, and now you're really looking at conceptual bits of things. Uh, and as you make changes, those will update. So that gives you that's, that's something that you see in Visual Studio that you don't see in Visual Studio Code. I can do that with all of my C Sharp classes. So remember before startup and configure services and all that? Yeah. Same kind of deal. Also, things like our app settings JSON, which we used earlier in the previous module for configuration, if there is something that has a, a, like an environment, like app settings dot production dot JSON or app settings dot JSON, that's something we didn't yet talk about. No. Remember, remember before when I did that, um, uh, I commented that line out so that I could see the, the uh, expect, except, the exception exceptions. page. Where was yeah. that? Do you remember where that was? Yeah. So I believe it was in your startup. There it is. Yeah. So here's. 
use developer exception page. And if you recall, it was, if you're in development, do that. Every time we ran the thing, it kept saying we were in production. Yes. I grew frustrated, <laughs> and I just went like that, which got me past that problem, but isn't correct. Okay. We'll go and right-click properties. And is it build or is it debug? Go to debug. There we go. And then you add it. Yep. So the environment variable, ASP.NET core underscore environment equals development is the thing that makes the difference. So trying tying that back to configuration, you can have different configuration options. You can have app settings dot whatever. And whatever, literally whatever, like foo. Anything. Testing, staging. Okay. Right? Whatever makes you happy. So in this case here, one app settings JSON has some stuff in it. Looks like it's got, oops, wrong button. Some logging that we'll learn about a little later. And then development. Look at the difference between the two. One has one is set for warnings and one is set for debug. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah, right? So a little bit of information there. So more, uh, more sophisticated than what we had originally set up. Let's return over to startup and see what else is different. So we've got that configuration that we did before. We've got services.addMVC. Here's an exception handler. This is an interesting little bit of code right here. So if we're in development, show the exception page that I like as a developer. Or if you're in production or really anything but development, we're just going to show the error. That way we don't give away our source code and okay. show people stuff. Now, you had me use use MVC before. Yes. This one has a little bit more information with different routes. Uh, we'll talk about that another time. And then we've also got static files in case you wanted to pick up a file. Remember that a couple of times we tried to pick up a file and it was skipping right past it because we didn't put the at page? Yes. It would have served that file if it found it on disk if we had said static files. So if we had added that line of code into the previous experiment, it would have just worked. It wouldn't have worked. It would have picked the file up and served it to us, but it would have picked it up as a static file. And not in what it intended. Okay. And not as a razor page and actually executed the code. So the order of these things matter, and also whether or not you want to you know, run that or pick it up as a static file, like a GIF or an HTML page. All right? So that's a little bit of a tour. Am I missing anything? I think that no, sounds good. That's good. Oh, what, oh, actually, one other point. Underneath www root, that's where your static things go. We've got our images there and our CSS. The pages, the, the static things are served out of root. And then the, the pages for our Razor Pages app are located in pages. But when I want to have an image, like slash images slash something, it's served out of the, so there is one thing that's new, um, mm -hmm. is the view imports, layouts. Ah, good point. So remember when we were goofing around earlier, and over here we had our page, and we had inject, mm -hmm. and that wasn't enough, and then we needed an at using, and then suddenly we had more directives than we had code. Yeah. That was a little weird. Well, you can do a thing called view imports, which is all of the things that you want every page to have, right? So we want every page to use this namespace to, and every other one to, this is using a namespace and this is the namespace of those pages themselves. There's well, also a thing called tag helpers that we'll talk about in the intermediate day. Yes, we will. And then view start is a piece of code multiple lines, <laughs> as many as you like, that runs for every view. Okay. All right, so if every view needed to check someone's name or check for cookies or whatever, like it depends how you want to do things. But these are the imports, all the different injects, all the different usings, and this is the little bit of code you want. In this case here, it's setting a layout. That's like uh, the main page that every other page wraps around. So here, layout dot CSHTML is a razor page that has the top level HTML, it has the head, it has the CSS, 
Probably has a footer somewhere. Yep, footer's okay. down here. There's some bootstrap and some different JavaScript. And then the your razor page is called the body. And it's rendered right there. It's rendered right there. So this is a good point, actually. Let me do this. Begin body and body. Okay? Okay. Let's run this. So this one is a little bit bigger, of course, than our uh, our previous application. So it might take a moment to uh, fire up. Okay. And Begin if you go to another one of the pages, let's say the home page. Body. Good point. This is the home page. Let's go to about. Yeah, it should be. Okay. Okay. So that's everything that's outside. Then this bit here would be everything coming from the page. Right here. Yeah. So start my page, end my page. Make sense? Yeah. All right. Cool. So I'm just undoing all of that. Little control Z. And we will come back in a moment and uh, try to build something. Yeah. That is non-trivial. <laughs> exactly. And we'll probably uh, make a couple mistakes. And it happens. And hopefully we will learn. And uh, we appreciate you learning with us. Thank you. Hey, friends. We're glad you're still with us here in Microsoft Virtual Academy as we do our intro to ASP.NET Core. We're learning all about Razor Pages and our application. This module will be, a, will be a little longer. Yes, it will. And it will probably have us making some mistakes together. And that's OK. And we're going to try not to hide anything from you. Yeah. We are following the, uh, the documentation, as we hope you are. And maybe you can follow along, pause, try stuff out, and uh, maybe Google with Bing <laughs> Google if you have trouble <laughs> and get stuck. Yeah, and we'll have links to the documentation right underneath this recording. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're going to try to make a CRUD yeah. page. What is CRUD? Create up. No script. Sorry. <laughs> Create, Create, read, read update, update, delete. delete. All right. So a CRUD application maps verbs from CRUD yeah. into verbs that we're used to using. Like a get is a get. So that would be like a read. Yeah. And if you're going to create something, it would be a post. post. So you'd fill out a form, you'd hit submit, and it would post the data. That's a create. Yeah. Then you can maybe read it back and look at an edit page, or then maybe delete it. So if yeah. we succeed, we'll have a simple form, maybe create some customers, put them in a fake database. Yeah. And we'll be OK. Yep. And, and we'll be learning more about databases in the intermediate course as well. Yes. We'll have a whole section on databases. So for now, we're going to be doing it in an in-memory database. Yes. OK. So let's do the best we can. We're going to use the same web application one that we created before. We saw in the previous uh, modules where we added MVC. But of course, all of that stuff was added for us because we went file new project. Yes. And we picked web application. All right? So here. In configure services, we've got add MVC, but we're going to make our little in memory database here. We're going to say services dot add db context or add database yeah. context. And give it a name. And we're going to create a thing called the app db context. We can name it whatever we want to. We haven't written this yet, but we will. I'm going to hit control dot, and it's saying, hey, do you need an app db context? Do you want to go and generate one of those. I want to go ahead and say yes. So it's gone and done that, and we'll, uh, we'll deal with that in a minute. Uh, again, I will very likely make mistakes, so you'll bear with me, I hope. I opened up the, um, the parentheses there, and I'm going to pass in some options. And the options I'm going to pass in for my database context are going to see options. Use memory. Use in memory. Database? Yes, but the reason why that's not showing that perfect. Uh, we so need why to is add, that not showing up? So we need to add um, the entity framework. So we need to use. Mm, I probably should have added that first, and I would have gotten IntelliSense. True. Let's try that. If we go back up to the top, so we add entity framework core beforehand. Yep. Ah, uh, look, you see how. See that little arrow there that's pointing down? Yeah. That means that this method came in, was included by the fact that we just did that using. Okay. That's called an extension method. It's along for the ride. 
and it, it actually says extension. That wasn't there seconds ago. No, was it? it wasn't. Yeah. Add in memory database, you know, some name. Yeah. All right. And then we look at the squiggle and we worry, does the squiggle mean something? Mm. So here it's saying AppDB context. Well, we never really went and did anything with that AppDB context. No. Let's go over there and fix that. I'm going to right click and say go to definition. And let's work on our database context. This is kind of standard stuff, so don't worry about it too much. But basically, this is representing the database. I'm hitting control dot there. And I'll say make it an AppDB context. Um, this is a uh, constructor, right? Yep. OK. And we're going to take in some options. Context options. Oops. Optunes. Yeah, options. Options. Pass up to the base class those options. I'm going to put that. When I'm trying to zoom and make it helpful for you, I end up making it worse for myself. Well, at least you have other people in mind. I do. And then I'm we're presuming you have to set it of some sort. We're okay. going to have a set of. Uh, what do you say, customers? Yes. So we have a set of customer. Customer does not exist yet. That's why it's squiggled out. And then we do the getter setter. Yeah. Get set. OK. Customer is squiggled out. The type or namespace customer could not be found. Well, that's true because we haven't made one yet. No. We've not made it up. I could type control dot, but I'm going to click show potential fixes. This is kind of interesting. Here it's saying, well, I could go and make a customer for you. Yeah. But look at this here. It's suggesting other packages that have the word customer, the name customer in it. So these are other NuGet packages, that's, packages up in the world. Yeah, isn't that cool? That's pretty cool. But yeah, there so is a package out there that has, has the word customer, customer in now, it. I don't want those. <laughs> but if I was doing something with JSON or doing something with some, you know, uh, some technology that I knew I would need the, the, uh, the NuGet package later, it would go get it for me. So I'm going to say generate in new file. That seems reasonable. It does. All right. So I just generated that. Now notice it just appeared. There it is. And now I'm going to right click and say go to definition. It is worth pointing out that I could also right click and say peak definition. And could you write in there? I could. I think that would be a little weird. But, I, 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 <laughs> but then I can click on this little tab right here, promote to document, and now I've jumped into that document. So I can peak, and then if I Type a little bit, and I was like, eh, this is tiresome, and I could jump even higher out. That's pretty smooth. It is pretty smooth. It's, All right, I'll show you another smooth tip. Oh, I, I know it. I know Which, it. Yeah, you want to suggest, the, please? What, the tab, tab thing? Yes, ready? <laughs> okay. Prop. Tab. Tab, tab. Yep. Int, tab, ID, enter, enter, prop, tab, tab, string, enter, tab, na name, right? How cool is that? <laughs> it, it, it's cool, and I always forget to use it. You got to use it. I always There's forget so to use it, and it's awesome. So, There's um, also prop full. Ooh. What does that do? That gives you a backing variable. There's uh, prop A, which I don't know what it does, but it's crazy. There's, um, <laughs> <laughs> there's prop G for a getter with a private setter. OK. Yeah, a bunch of stuff. It's great. Have you done a, um, have you done a blog post on all the property? Uh, there's a bunch of snippets. I could go all day. OK. But I'm just going to use prop for now. OK. Um, so this is customers. So customers have an ID, a unique ID, and they have a name. And they could probably have an email. They could have all these things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We'll start with name for now, but should name have some constraints? It should. Um, and we have the idea of data annotation. Mm -hmm. There's so annotation one, on that data, yes. So one of the things is that you probably want someone to enter their name, right? We want to force them, really. We want to force them. So we want to make sure it's some sort of required, right? So required, and I'm putting it as an annotation here, and I'm going to hit Control dot again. When you, when you learn that these things exist and you're thinking about them, rather than typing in all this stuff for the using, you're just going to type required. Yeah. Hit Control dot and then hit Enter. Line 1 just appeared there. And then we'll force the length as well. Let's say a length of, we'll, we'll, we'll be silly for a moment, we'll say a length of 10. OK. That's not a very good length. That is not a good length at all. But that might allow us to do some validation later. OK. And then we'll change it to a longer length. All right, so let's back up for a second and see what we did here. So we have in our startup an in-memory database, yeah. not a SQL server or a 
whatever, just an in-memory database. We have a beginnings of a customer, unique ID and a name, some annotations on it. And then a little class here that's kind of empty that is our list of customer. And actually where it says customer uh, singular here, yeah. that should be customers. Words. Okay, because because yeah, this is a set, set of, of customer. customers. All right. So the one thing, how are we going to see this information? Well, we're going to need to uh, probably put some in the database, and then once we have them in the database, list them out. Oh, I mean, like how are we going to visually see it? We're yeah. going to have to have some. So sort there's of a data. bit of a of a chicken and the egg problem there. Like, do we make the listing page first? And list them out, but we really can't because we don't have any. You don't have anything, yeah. Or we make a create page first. So it's crud. Yeah. We'll do the C first. Okay. So over in the pages folder. Pages. Let's do create. Now we're not going to say new file like we did before. No, you're going to create a new razor page, or if you go to new file. Oh, let me do that Sorry. again. Okay. Right click. Uh, add. add. So I get two choices. I have new and then, razor page, or I can say item. Yeah, new item. And they should be the option to pick Razor page. Right. So you've got a couple different options here. And this is all the different things that you could make. I'm going to go and right click and say Add Razor page. Yeah. And I'm going to point out that I'm not going to do it for this because it would be a little bit cheating. But after we're all done, yeah. first we make you suffer. And then we show you the easy way. <laughs> then we show you the easy way. We could create that model and then say Razor pages using Entity Framework CRUD. And it would then scaffold or generate every single all the hard parts event. that we're about to do. But Can it's more we just fun do to that? do it. No, no, it's more <laughs> fun to do it ourselves. Don't you think? All right. All right, let's all do right. it ourselves. Yeah. People can fast forward if they don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> so the page name would be create. Uh -huh. And then we're going to use a layout. Exactly. Right? We saw that. And then here it says generate page model. That's that code behind or that page model. We could say no and then do that in line if we wanted to. All right, so let's see if that works. So thinking, thinking, thinking. We're going to watch on the right-hand side here as create should appear. And it's taking a while because it's doing quite a bit of scaffolding well, for you, Well, it's scaffolding right? out some work for us, but it's also going to build the application to see if it, it still builds and if uh, it's running a scaffolder. And scaffolder is just something that you can go and read about and write your own if you feel like it. So here we got to create. So let's see what we have in let's there. Let's see. It gave us a page. It gave us a default model, okay. a title, looks like a uh, header, and then some validation scripts, and then presumably we can just start typing our Your our pages or okay. whatever. Okay. Let's look at the back end. It made a create model that has a get. So this is the function that happens when we get stuff. Okay. okay. All right. So we're going to need to make a form. Cool. All right. So a form that would have actually just one. Um, entry. Yep. So we'll say enter your name figure. Right? Yeah. And who knows if this will work. Again, we're going to learn. Now, this is interesting. Notice that when I type form, where is it in purple? It turns purple. So that is a tag helper. This is some f related elements that are going to be on the server for processing. So the server knows about purple yeah. elements and will do some processing of them. Typically, when you're in HTML, you have like a P tag or an image tag yeah. or a div. And that's just strings that get sent off to uh, the, the client. But when we're generating this stuff on the, uh, on the server side, there might be an opportunity for ASP.NET Core to, to improve it, to change okay. it, to add stuff. So it knows about form. Form is, is a magic tag. And we can go and type things like this. You see it says ASP colon. Yeah. So is that indication of that, that is a tag helper with some sort of action? Right. Okay. These things aren't HTML. No. Those are tag helpers. You'll never see ASP hyphen something being sent all the way out to the, uh, the browser. These are not HTML. They're so if, hints to the server. So if you, if when we run this application and we go into the F12 tools, mm -hmm. we will not see? You shouldn't see those. OK. Exactly. So we're going to say form. This is going to be basic method equals a, yeah, see, get, okay. post, put, delete. We'll say post. So we're going to go in post. Here's the end of our form. Say div, name, and then we'll need a text box. Yep, so some sort of input tag. Yep, mm -hmm. input. Now this is interesting. We could do an input tag the way we usually do, or we could say ASP.NET 4. Okay. 
and we're going to say customer.name. Okay. See how it's all purple? That ASP4 is going to look at that model. Okay. Now it's saying here, I don't know what a customer is. What's going on with that? It's never heard of customer before. We'll come back and fix that in a second. Okay. Then we'll have an input uh, for submitting that form. Okay. But we have a problem here where it doesn't know what customer is. What is the model for this page? Right? It's the, the create. create model. So let's go look at that. Peek into definition. Okay. I want to point out how I'm moving around. I'm right clicking and saying go to definition. There's also a hotkey for that. So this is an important reminder just as a programmer. You don't want to necessarily find yourself going over and looking around all the files all the time. You can navigate to it, you know, right? to it directly. You can navigate logically, as they say. Okay? All right. Did you, you, call, you cut something out for Yeah. Me. Okay. Uh, create. There we go. Oh, yeah, cut out create model. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. So our create model is going to need to know about customers because that's going to show up on the page. So public customer, that's a type, that's a name. You can yeah. tell by their color. It's a little confusing, but uh, the, the property is called customer and the type is called customer. Okay. And uh, this is going to need that database so, context. So we're going to make a little database here. And this is a good, just being the voice of the person who's watching no, this at home. Um, why have you made it private read only? Um, so that's a great point. So I don't want people who get a hold of create model to be poking around and talking directly to the database. So it's going to be private just, okay. for, just for me where me is create model. And it's read only, which means I'm going to assign it once and I don't want anyone to touch it after that. Yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm making it just for me and I'm making sure I can't mess with it afterwards. Excellent, excellent question. So then we'll make our um, create model, our um, constructor. Mm -hmm. And remember how dependency injection works. We don't make an AppDB context; we ask for one. We ask for it by putting it in our constructor. And we can have as many of these as we want. We can have foo and bar and etc. 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 This is the one we want for now. Okay. And then I'm just going to say, hey. This one equals that one. I'm going to squirrel it away and hang on to it. So now I've got one. Okay. So that says there's this database and I want to know about it. This says there's a, a, a customer. If I go back over to create, I can hover over that and see it's getting me probably IntelliSense too. Yep, see? Yeah, it is. So it, it, it knows about customer because it's hanging off of the model. So as we're running the application, technically, mm -hmm. I should be able to go to this page, hover over customer name, and see what names we put in there? You should be able to click on that. You should be able to have IntelliSense. Yep. Um, if you did a breakpoint, yep. you should be able to stop in here at some point and look at that, and we'll do that in a little bit. Um, what we need to, though, is we need to bind this form, we're saying this input for customer name. When I hit submit, we need to catch it on the, on the server okay. side. I call it surviving the journey. Okay, yeah, that's a good point. It does need to survive the journey. So I'm going to get rid of this on get here. So we're going to do a post. You can say on post. You could do it like this, but the right way to do it is like this. Async? Async, which means don't block. And we're going to have a task that returns some action. We're going to, you know, we might be doing something after this. And I'm going to say on post async. And it's giving me a little complaint here saying, eh, you didn't do any an, a, a wait and you haven't returned a value. Code pass. Not all code paths return a value. Okay. That's because we haven't done anything yet. So when someone posts back, they hit submit and it posts back to here, we would really like customer to have stuff in it. Yes. And so there's a couple things here. And then we need to make sure that the state of that model is valid, valid. that someone hasn't mm -hmm. messed with it. So I'm going to say if 
model state is valid, or if it's not, yeah. pardon me. I was, I was about to no, say something. <laughs> I appreciate that. Then okay. return the page back to itself to say, okay. yeah, no, I'm done. If I hover over page, you can see it returns a page result, which is a kind of action. Returning a page is an action. If we get that this, this far, yeah. now I'm going to say DB. Remember when I say DB? Yes. What is DB? It is a application DB context. Yep. In there is customers, plural. And we want to add one. Dot add. We'll pass in the customer that uh, we just got handed. Okay. And then we'll say, hang out for a minute, await, and we'll say DB save changes. And async means don't wait. Then we will go and return, not a page, because we're going to We've, we're on the create page. We really want to return to the list. Yep. So you're doing a redirect? We're going to do a redirect, exactly. And we haven't actually got a place to go yet, but we'll say redirect to page. Okay. And you can see that there's options like redirect to page permanent, which would be a 301, an okay. HTTP 301. We're going to do a 302 because this is just a standard kind of redirect. We'll just say slash index. And I think we should probably just say like slash but we'll see what happens. If people wanted to learn more about 301, 302s, do you have any recommendations? The internet. Correct. Uh, yes, <laughs> I, would, I would search around for that kind of stuff. Ultimately, look at the docs. Yeah. But like redirect to page is a standard thing. And again, if you hover over it, it says right there, status 302 found. But if I said redirect to page permanent, would we'll change it? Change it to a 301, okay. which would tell the search engine, don't ever come back here and ask me about this again. <laughs> don't ever talk to me again. Go here. All right. That's what that means. I'm paranoid, so anyway, you never want to do that when you're doing database work. You always want to be temporary. Okay? Okay. All right. And if you really, really, really want to like upset your coworkers, <laughs> you could move your curly braces. Yeah and do stuff like this. And if you really want to be possibly buggy, you could even do stuff like this, where that's all one line. Yeah. But you know, you might have other stuff that you, you want to, to do. Add. Okay. Some, some people that really bothers them, some people it doesn't. For me... Does it bother you? I kind of like it on one line if it's not that big of a deal. You know what I mean? Because it's just, it's just, but as soon as you have an extra line, then you're going to go and undo it and take it apart. Yeah, so it's not, it's, it's not really a, but it's not really a best practice for someone to know right now. No, for, okay. for right now, I just think it's nice to have everything fit on one line like okay. that. But uh, using, using the curly mustaches mm -hmm. uh, is uh, curly braces. They look like a mustache if you turn your head. Um, that's a best practice. It, it still gets into when people say curly braces, and I don't know what they're talking about because I use brackets. Them? You call them brackets? So you have brackets, curly brackets, square brackets, so. Oh, scandalous. Okay. Um, you fancy. That is pretty, that is pretty intense. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> now, I'm going to put a breakpoint here. Okay. And we'll see if this works. All right. There, it might very well not work. Fingers crossed and toes. No, it's probably not going to work. Lower your expectations now. All right. Okay. Mm -hmm. This is in create, right? So I have to hit slash create. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Did we bind it? Yeah. See what's happening? Nothing. No. And if we go and do a view source. And you go to, okay. I just want to show the people the form first. Some things showed up on the input that's kind of cool. That's kind of nice. That is. We didn't type that, right, remember? So we're getting stuff on the input that we did not expect, which and is cool. And some request yeah, verification. Yeah, the request verification token to keep people from tampering with mm -hmm. our stuff. There's your name, customer.name, and it generated an ID for us as well. But you can see that nothing's happening. On customer, 
Actually, let's, I'm going to put a breakpoint a little higher up, and then I'll explain to you what's going on. Okay. Let's see if we can even get to the post. Okay. Do a debug session again, slash create. So I would have expected to hit that breakpoint. To hit that breakpoint. So that's concerning. But I know that I need to say bind property on the customer, which is to tell it I want this customer object filled out with the form information. Right? Yeah. And right now I don't have that. So let's take a look and try this again. The customer is going to get um, created and filled up with information bound to those form, uh, those form uh, fields. If that doesn't work, then I've forgotten something and we will go and have a little debugging, which will be fun as well. They say the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. <laughs> Let's take a look. It's probably something obvious. So we've got a form. We've got our input. We've got our method. I said POST. Does it matter if it's all caps? That would be odd if it did. So it doesn't matter. The tag helper exists already in view imports. The form is there. The only thing I didn't add is the validation summary. Okay. Okay. All right, so I'm putting in a long name, Fancy Pants, and nothing's happening. No. No. Uh, and I'm realizing that I've got my form with my input for customer name, but I put my validation summary outside the form. Oh, okay. So I'm going to put it inside the form because it's validating the form. And then I'm going to hit refresh. Fancy pants. See? And it says the field name must be a string with maximum length 10. I'm getting that, uh, that validation for free. Right? And where did that 10 come from? We said it in, yep, right there. Said it right there. So maybe we'll change that to like 25 or something. something Some people have really know. long names. Like in my country, people have names that are 50 and 50. So maybe 100. I'll make 49, and then that 150 <laughs> person, they're going to suffer. Oh, man. Inclusion. But the point is, it's driven by, by that. By that. OK? Uh, and then one other thing. So That's, it would be the same if someone did um, entered something that wasn't an email, right? Yeah, it could be an email. It could be you could put in validation information however you want, and you could even put in custom regular expressions, or even write your own custom validators. So they can be as sophisticated as you want. Okay. You could also, I believe, say I want a span, and say ASP validation for, and you could go and do a field by field validation. Okay. So here I'm saying, this is my summary of all the different things. This is a specific validation for customer name. OK, let's see what that okay. looks like. That might look a little different. So I'm going to come over here, go back, come back over here and hit refresh. Oops, I actually know it hit refresh. I need to run my app again because I stopped it. OK. I'll run that again. Go to create. Uh, I think we made it really long this time, right? And I tab away, and it says it must be a string with a maximum length of 49. Okay. Okay. But I like the uh, the main validation stuff, so we'll leave that like that. Okay. Now, let's go back to our breakpoints and run our debug this time and see if we can see the customer get bound. Okay. And we had looked in the, 
F12 developer tools before, we could see what's happening on the wire. This is a good way to kind of just see what's happening as you do your posts. So were you looking, so you went to developer tools yep, and then network? I went to dot, network. dot, dot, developer tools, and we're under, under network. Okay. I will go and uh, probably clear it out, and then we'll put in Maria. Okay. Yep. There we go. So if All you right. hover over that. So we hover over customer. See? Because it's there because customer has a name. Yeah. Customer dot name and we named the field customer dot name and we told it, hey bind, we want you to participate. You automatically showed up in there. Okay. And I can put a little pin there as well. If I was going to do lots of debugging sessions and I can keep you there as a post-it note and watch customer name change over, over time. time. Yeah. That's a good one. We can go and see if the model state is valid. It is. What is the green button? Oh, that's a play. Like okay. Yeah, go to that point. Play play up to that point. And then stop. Uh, so here I'm going to go and add that customer to the database, save it to the database, which of course is an in-memory database. Mm -hmm. And then we'll redirect, redirect. Now we had put in slash, but I'm not sure if that's going to work. Should we should we see what Let's the error out. page is, just in case? Yeah, see. Okay. It says no page slash matches this value. So you have to give the specific name. I need to say name. index, which was what uh, our main our main page is here. So index. Okay. Now we'll confirm that that works. I can hit F5 to go and debug, or I can hit Control F5, which I like to do because it starts up a little faster if I know that I'm not going to do a debugging session. But this time you hit F5? I hit, I hit Control F5 to go okay. faster. Okay, so it redirected me to index, but of course I haven't done anything on index that's interesting yet. Okay. That'll be the next part, right? So you could also probably send a message saying... I could oh. say customer updated or whatever. But let's rip out this whole section here. Okay, you're going to and just... put a list of contacts. Okay. Is that cool? So where's our index? So this is all this carousel and all this stuff. Like all the fancy bootstrap. I'm going to actually go like this. I do, and then you comment it out. Actually, no. I'm just going to be awesome and just like toss it. Wow. Yeah. But this is a way if you want to go hunting for the other side of the div, you can just fold these up. See that this matches this. Fold it up, select over it, and toss it. Cool. All right. So let's make our form. And this will be on the index page, right? Yep. We'll have method equals post. And this will be a table. All right. It's okay to use tables if it is a table of data. Let's see, so many people complain about tables being a bad idea. You know, I think that's kind of funny. <laughs> it's a table. It's okay to have a table. So we'll have a head for our table, and we'll have our ID row. Yep. Oops. And we'll have ID. And we'll have name. We don't really need to show the database ID, but for now, we'll show it. All right. Cool? So do you have to create a toy people? OK, yeah. You're way ahead of me. No, it's OK. Table body. <laughs> but now I need a row for each. Uh, so would you put it in the row, or would you? So I'm presuming that you'd need to go for like for every contact within. Exactly. So I'm going to have like a four or something here, yeah. then a couple of cells, table cells, and then maybe a, uh, I don't know, like a link to edit and yeah. like a delete button. Yeah. Okay. You or, see how I'm kind of sketching it out? You're sketching it out. Okay. Wait, what's it called? Um, pseudocode? Pseudocode. It's yeah. a little, little pseudocode here. So now I'm going to say at. For each. Yeah. And this is a snippet. Yeah. Tab, tab, and then I'm going to say for each contact, oops, contact in, in what? In, in model. model. Now, where's our customers? 
Okay? So remember before when we were doing our create model, we needed to have uh, the customers come from somewhere. Yes. Now we're in a totally different page. Oh, yeah, so we have to have the customers. We're going to have the customers, yeah. right? So I'm going to just take a break here and I'm going to jump over to the index model because we, we can't really make our table until we have a little bit more. <laughs> okay? And I'm going to break a couple of cardinal rules and I'm going to copy paste a little code because I'm going to need this similar app database, this app DB context. So I'm just going to save myself a moment of time here. So we've got our app context, right? And we're going to have our index page model. Now before, when we create a customer, we create one customer. Yeah. But here our model is different because we're going to have a list of customers on this page, right? So our model is different. And we'll do a get and then a private set so that uh, only we can set it. Okay. All right. And then in the on get, we'll say on um, get. One line below. Did you? On get sync. Okay. On get async, right? We're going to load up customers. Where do we get them from? The database. Okay. And this is right there. We get them out of customers. And then there's this other little bit of thing that you can add on to make things a little bit faster. You can say as no tracking. And I'll show you what that means in a second. And we're going to turn these customers into a list of customers. So we're chaining things together. We're saying, give me these customers. And we are not, we're not going to keep track of them changing. You see it says, Disabling change tracking is useful for read-only scenarios. Change tracking is watching, like keeping a track of all the different things you could change yeah. so that you know how to make a database update. So if I had a list of customers and I wanted to watch all of them and change their names, that would give the database system, Entity Framework, that we're going to learn about later, all the information it needs about how to only change the bits that change, how to only, you know, change the database. But we're just getting a list. So we're going to say, don't track these, just give me a list. Okay. So customers, no tracking, give me a list. So that's cool. And uh, I think we'll leave that like that for now. We'll go back over to index. And now that model, the page behind us, has customers. Look, customer shows up, see? Yeah. Which is nice. So then I think I can put my TR in here. And I'm hoping, remember it says, oh, I said contact. I should say customer. Customer singular. For each customer, that means that the customer um, variable is now available to me. Customer dot, see? Mm -hmm. yeah. Everything's connected. Yep. Cool. Let's try that. Okay. And then we'll do the rest because I don't know if this is going to work yet. Now I'm using an in memory database, so every time I run this, it's going to go away. So it's just throwaway database, yeah. I need to do better. I need to, you know, maybe make tests later. And um, I survived the journey. You did. Let's see. But as soon as I shut you down, it's going to be gone. So if you refresh the page? No, I, you're here. You're still there, right? You're there. You're there until I close it. Until, until I close this browser, or not? Until I close the browser. Pardon me. Until I stop the web server. So, okay. Yeah. Thanks. Cool. So now uh, we've got create. We should probably put a button down there at the bottom somewhere. Uh, we've got some validation. We've got our our database. We can add our friends. And this is doing a thing called post redirect get. So I'm here, I hit a post, we do a redirect, and then we do a get, and then we would get this stuff here. So this is a PRG, post redirect get. There's lots of articles on the internet about that. Now let's make a link to theoretically go and edit these things. Okay. And then we'll have a button for delete. These things don't exist on the back end yet. So yeah, so we don't have an edit page yet. We don't. So. Okay. We can make a link. Now I could go and put in a link, href, you've done this before yep. a million times and say slash edit and then like put in 
strings and stuff, but remember we talked about how great tag helpers are. Yeah. What if we went and said ASP page, and then we could go and say there was an edit page, and then it would figure out what the URL would look like. Okay. All right. And then it could even express the route a certain way. And we'll talk about routes in a minute. Route, I think it's route ID. And I think we called it customer ID. So it's going to take yeah. that customer's ID. So we want to basically make a page that looks like slash edit slash two, slash edit slash three, all right? And that's the route ID that's going to get added on to that. OK. OK. And so the next thing you had was a button. Yeah, we'll do a button. Type equals submit. And this is going to be handled by the page. OK. Button's going to be a little different. The reason that we're doing a button in, a, in, a, in an href is so that you can see the difference between a link and how links behave and buttons. Like a link is going to navigate somewhere. Yep. And a button is going to cause a post, right? So this will go and be handled by the delete handler. But we also need that route information. We need that ID because we're going to delete a particular customer. So you customer. need the content ID. Yeah. Customer ID, exactly. All right. And then none of this is hooked up. So you mentioned something, voice of the people at home, mm -hmm. um, about the button, button being a post. Yes. It is going to post back, and then we're going to need to handle that behavior differently than uh, than the um, create page. So there, I just put a link at the bottom there for create. So I'm just going to hit refresh. So let's see if the so create. Here's our create. OK. That still works. OK. If I hover over that, nothing's happening because we don't have an edit. Right? We never made an edit page. And if I hit delete, you should. it's going to crash because it's like, well, I don't know what you're doing. Right? It's just in the middle of something, and it's confused because that's not what I asked it to do. Okay? So we've got some fixing up to do. Let's try delete first. Okay. All right. So let's go over here. We made an on get. Let's go and make an on delete. Okay. Same thing as before at an action result. Except now we're going to say on, and this is kind of weird, on post delete. The verb delete is uh, a real HTTP verb. Okay. But it's not really often used from a browser's perspective. It's usually done um, as it's piggybacked on post. We use, we use post to pass in basically all kinds of information. Uh, when we, whenever, we, whenever, we hit a, whenever we hit submit on a form, we're posting that form. We're adding in, I think we said, page handler delete. So that is going to be here on post delete. And now we're going to say, hey, uh, oops, customer, customer singular. And we'll go and get that customer okay. out of the database. Before we delete it, we got to go and get it to make sure it's there. I say find by that ID that got passed in. So now we got to check to see if that customer is like null or not. Because yeah. if it's null, then we don't even bother. If it's not null, do something. And then we can go and, and redirect to a page. To a page, exactly. Thank you. So here, we're going to remove it from the database. And we're doing it into memory database, but it doesn't matter because if it was a regular database, it would remove it for us as well. That's what's nice about Entity Framework. I'm not a very good typer. Customer. So we remove the customer, and then we go and we save those changes. OK. And then I would expect it would then redirect to the page, the same page. Yes. And I would expect that it would disappear from that list, because it's going to go back to the database and build the list again. Does that make sense? It I does. Think, sure does. I think that's what it will do. So we cross our fingers and hope that it works. And if it doesn't, we learn. OK. That's not a good name. All right. 
we're deleting you. Okay, I'm fine with that. It does work the way you. Uh, it does work. Do do do. Fancy pants. But now if we edit, edit. though, it doesn't work because it doesn't edit doesn't exist. Edit is not there. All right, so let's go and do edit then. So we'll do what you said before. Add razor page. Call it edit. Now I know you like routing. Routing is one of your favorite things about ASP.NET. So this edit page is going to be the first time that we've ever had a page that took in information. Okay. Where does that go to pass in the ID? So up there at page, mm -hmm. right? Right. Quotes. Quote, quote. Yeah, and curly brackets. Okay. ID. Yeah. Dot. I mean, some, yeah, int. Okay, so the ID is of type int. Yes. That's the type hint. So this is saying edit slash three. So you'd see it in the browser, that's what it would look like. Okay. We have our edit model. And then here at the top, we might have like edit. We could actually add a little bit of text here. We could say edit customer. And then we could say um, dash model. You know, at model dot customer. But again, we're not getting IntelliSense. Why not? Because the page model is different for each page. Exactly. Yeah. So let's go look at the one for edit. So I'm going to You're going to take a yeah. borrow again. Certainly I could make another class, a base class that would pull that app db context in so I wouldn't have to keep copy pasting that because at some point the copy pasting becomes tedious. And, and you know, you want to keep it dry, right? Don't yeah. repeat yourself. We probably want that to survive the journey, right? Yep. Okay. So we want to survive the journey with bind property. Okay. So we go back over to our page. And let's see if that worked. And it did. Isn't that nice? Yes, it is. So now we can say... We are model.customer.id, so we can say, you know, edit customer four or whatever. And then a form, and then a form post. And there's some lots of cool ways to make your forms easier to write. If you find writing forms tedious, there is a really great way to write forms that is called Emmet. What is Emmet? Ever heard Emmet? of Emmet? Emmet, E M M. ET, it's like the name, the person's name, Emmett. Okay. And it's a way of describing what you want, like a, it would be like TRT, TRTD times three, and then you'd hit tab, and it would go and expand it. It's a, it's a way to write tags for HTML really, really fast. Is it built in? It's built into Ace, uh, to Visual Studio Code, but it is not built into Visual Studio yet. Okay. Notice how I got this here. I'm, as soon as I said ASP.NET 4, yep. it gave you input 4, rather, uh, it got that. That's just really nice, right? So I can go and fill out these forms really quickly, and I don't have to worry about it. That's going to happen on the server side. Okay, so then we'll say a label, and this is a label also for the customer. The customer's name, mm -hmm. which is nice. And then we'll say maybe another div. And then within there, we'll have an input for customer name. And then you're going to do the validation again, yeah, right? I'll do some, I can do validation two different ways. You know, I could do the um, validation summary, or we can do it like this, which is nice. And what are the key differences? This one is you have total control of what it looks like. You can put it anywhere, up or down. Okay. And this is just a bulleted list that's a roll-up. Okay. Of all of the stuff. Totally up to you how you want to do things. This is all inside of a form, right? So you want to save it, right? Yep, we're going to need a save button, exactly. So we'll put our button at the bottom. And it's just a regular old submit, nothing fancy about it. And it'll say save. But we're going to want to load this up mm -hmm. and save it and have validation. We've done all that very nicely like this. And we just want to confirm, like you said, on the back end, that we do the right thing. Mm -hmm. 
So on the get, actually let's do this. Let's run it first and then we'll try it again because right now we haven't hooked anything up. We haven't got it from the database. We haven't updated it from the database. But I would expect the links to at least work. Yeah. Because now there is a, an edit page. If there's not, then maybe I forgot something. Okay, look in the corner there. Okay. It's kind of hard for me to do that. I can take a screenshot. Well, I can't really take a screenshot. Let's do this. I'll take a snipping tool. Give it a delay of two seconds. You're that fast? I am. Huh? Oh. So edit slash one, right? So the route got built by the fact that it was in the edit and then you had ha added that ID at the top there. So this is nice because we didn't have to hard code what a link looked like. That's really yeah. important. We said, make me a link that takes me here. Mm -hmm. We didn't say, make me a link that looks like this. No. So that's nice. That's and if we changed clean. our things later, then it would change for us, which is nice. So here, if I click on that, I assume it'll just do, yeah nothing. So it's like, I don't have anything there. It doesn't know about customer yet because we have the bind, but we never loaded the customers. So let's go and do our stuff again. We're going to have our action result. And here we're going to say on get, yeah. of course, int ID. Mm -hmm. That's going to get passed in automatically because of the way we set up our routes, which is nice. So By default, we'll just return to the page. But here, we'll say customer, the one above. Yep. Go and get it from the database. And find it, okay. Yep, so find async, kind of a standard thing. You could pass in more complicated queries and get it other ways. If it's null, freak out, <laughs> all right? Yeah. If customer equals null, I don't know. Let's put them back to index. It's customer, right? Ah, uh, yes, pardon me, customer. Okay, redirect, oops, redirect to page index. A lot of typing, but we don't want to hide anything from you. Keeping it 100. We are absolutely keeping it 100. So this should load that up and give us a form with the customer in it. Let's see if it does, because we added that bind property, which you said, what did you call it? Surviving the journey. Surviving the journey. You saw that Idris movie where they survived the journey. Don't tell me what happens at the end. So at the end. I don't want to know. Okay, and then I hit edit, and then it works. Exactly. Right? So what happens if you change, if I change it, it? Probably nothing. Right? So we don't have our post. Exactly. Exactly. So we've got our get, but we don't have our post. You could kind of copy that. Um. Yes, I could, I could. I think I thought there was a way. I think there's a way to actually generate like that whole thing quickly. But we'll say on post async. All right. The very end, we will do that redirect to the index page. To the index page, exactly. Okay. What do we do? Well. We've got that model state valid yes, issue, so right? Yes, so like if not model. Oops, not model state is valid. Yeah, we want it to return to the page. Okay. Ah! Page. <laughs> See, you try to type too fast to impress people, and it just ends up making you look silly. Okay. Now this you, one's an interesting one because you want to attach it to the yeah. database. Yeah. So what we're doing is we're modifying something that's already in the database. So what we're trying to do is take this customer that we are mm -hmm. we're currently editing. So it's in the current state. Uh -huh. Attach that customer and the, the state of it in the database, we're going to mark that as modified. And this bit here, it I shouldn't, don't want have, that. shouldn't be there. Yeah. I don't want yeah. That. Oh, so that's I'm going to go and yeah. add the using statement. There we go. Now it's turned blue. Okay. Now we don't know if it's going to work because someone else could be simultaneously editing 
at the same time. Exactly. So you want to do a try and catch. And do a try. Mm -hmm. Maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't. And the exception that we're going to catch for is called a DB update concurrency exception. So just in case someone's doing it. Someone's in there at the exactly same time or it's gone what it or says. whatever. You know, okay. That's exactly what it is. So you're going to wait for changes? Mm -hmm. I'm going to go and wait and say save the changes async. And presumably that'll work fine. If it doesn't... Went through an exception. Now, there's different arguments about the right way to do this. But for now, I'm going to go and say customer. And this is kind of cool. Customer.id. See, I'm getting IntelliSense yeah. inside the string. We can do whatever we want to about that concurrency exception, but the, and maybe even pass it in as an inner exception. But the fact is, actually, that'd be a good idea. We'll pass that in along for the ride. We want to give a message to the to somebody that bad stuff has happened. All right, that should be. I think we've almost got crud, don't we? We do. Mm -hmm. We've done the create. Let's go see. The thing, the create was a post. Yep. The read is the for loop. The delete was also a post, but with a delete with a delete sidecar <laughs> along for the ride. So create. Dan. Oh, breakpoints from before. Oh uh, yeah. I will remove those. I think continue. you still have okay. Continue. We'll, we'll, we'll bump into them if we have more. Fancy pants. Beyonce. Oh, that's a good point. Edit. Carter. Carter Knowles. Yeah. Don't get it twisted. <laughs> <laughs> Delete everyone else who's not worthy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Oh, so. See? It works. It does work. And there you go. Taking care of business. Cool. So let's think about that. So that's pretty sweet. It is. If we go back and just conf uh, kind of review, particularly this bit here, we've got our edit mm -hmm. with the route ID where we did not so say what file how are the we looking at right now. I'm sorry, this is index. Okay. Right? So here we got a an edit. I want to point out how it looks in the uh, in the code, and yeah. then compare that to how it looks ultimately in the code, right? When it when it makes it all the way back uh, to the browser. See, it's in. So that came from this. Now this seems like a lot more. You might be asking yourself why you don't just hard code that, but the you know routes change, pages change, things get moved around. Now this one's a little bit more interesting here because you might have multiple buttons on the page that do different stuff. Mm -hmm. So then you can give them a handler name. Right? I could have delete, I could have boldface Beyonce, I could have all caps. Yeah. Right? We could have whatever. You're not limited to one button. Ooh. The submit button can have you can have multiple submits still pass in numbers, like in this case, ID. Yep. And this is an ampersand. Yep. Multiple handlers, delete, promote, whatever. Save. Save, whatever. exactly. Yeah, OK. And what's cool about that is that then that word delete, if we look at the behind, is this word. So that I think didn't. you could even go like on post foo async or whatever, as long as it lines up. Because you're saying on post and then some handler. Yes. Isn't that cool? That is and that handler is, like literally you could say, oh, let me stop our, stop our debugging here. You're going to try the foo? Right, like it could be whatever, it doesn't matter. Okay. That, that word is totally up to you. So I don't need to. I don't need to test that. You just trust me. You don't trust me. Yeah, sure. All right, let's test it. Then. <laughs> okay. Let's so, test it. That gives you a lot of flexibility okay. that with with buttons. So I say foo right there. Go over here. We say foo. 
And there you go. So while that's loading, what were you going to say? No, no, no. I trust you. I just want to. I trust you ish. I also want trust you ish. It. Yeah. That's pretty good. I'll take that. Uh, let's go and add people. Okay. That was foo. How did foo know it was delete? Uh, I it, because it doesn't matter <laughs> that it was named foo. It's just a handler name, and if we confirm it. Did I pass it? Uh, 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 no. Oh, this is create. Sorry. There you go. There's a delete. Uh. Okay. See, it says handler equals foo. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. And then I just happen to name this handler foo also. Yes. So the yeah. point is, it lined up. And that's how you can have unlimited verbs. And then at that point, it just did the thing and removed it from the database. Cool? Cool. So we saw uh, lots of different handlers like gets and posts and custom handlers like delete. Yep. We saw some tag helpers that will generate buttons and links for us. We saw layout pages. We saw validation. We saw validation, both summary and uh, individual. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah. Yeah, we looked at a little bit about routing in a little bit more detail. Mm -hmm. We saw routing and then specifically, actually one thing that would be worth pointing out about routing as well, if I click edit, did we, oh, I, I, I shut the app down again. Uh, you had said int, id colon int. Yes. Where int was, uh, you know, a number, correct? It would be interesting to just confirm that if we put in submit query, edit, she is one. Yes. Put in a ID that is not an int. You should get a... You specifically get a 404. You don't get a 500. It's not an error. It's a route that doesn't exist. Yeah. We don't have an edit that takes a string. So that's another really, really important thing to point out about, about routing and why that little bit up there was so significant. And then soon in the intermediate sections, we will learn uh, a little bit more about web APIs and URLs and mixing and matching pages as well. So yeah. we take a short break and come back with a little bit of logging. Yes, we will. All right, we survived the crud. <laughs> yeah, we, we did. did. Create, read, update, and delete. Uh, we're going to add in some logging. Yeah. Do a little application insights locally. And, uh, and then in the process of doing logging, I also want to add a little bit of thing called temp data. Okay. Because I was noticing that when we did the create, it'd be nice to have a little message that said Beyonce was created or whatever. Ah, uh, yeah, that would be nice. But, uh, you know, that's not really part of the model. So yeah. that brings up some interesting questions. So, for example, if we go back to create and just re-familiarize ourselves with that, right? We type in the name and we hit submit. And then if we look at the page model behind that, it's pretty straightforward, right? We have the customer that, as you say, with the bind property, survives the, so, so, so that's the journey. Survives the journey. But it'd be nice to have a message that would be some temporary piece of data that would say, oh, yeah, customer got added. Okay. So we could go and have a string and call it message. This is interesting, though, because it's part of the page model, but not part of the database. Yes. This is part of the, the, the page model, which is kind of like a view model. This is really a temporary piece of data. It's temp data. And they're going to have their values stored, and then they'll be right back around the other side. So it's, it's a sidecar. It's a little post-it note. Okay. Well, that's a good way to think like about that? it. Yeah. Cool. So it's a place to put stuff. So I'm going to save the database, save the data right here like we did before. And then you're going to have a message. We're going to have a little message. And we'll say, hey, customer. And this is where you can personalize stuff. Customer name added. It's a message, right? And it could come out of whatever you want. It could be generated. But here we're mixing and matching text with the, the data from the, uh, the form. And I'm squirreling it away in this message here, which is not part of the database. So this, by the simple fact that you've had the tape temp data, it said, you're not going into the database. Right, because I posted that, well, I mean, because I actually never picked it up and put it anywhere near the database. Mm. 
if I did not put temp data on it, that would never get saved and it would be null. To okay. Be but it, because it's public and it's on the page model, it's available to me, you know, elsewhere. Okay. So let's go over to, do, 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 do. let me think about this. Would you go to your index page yep. or something? Yep, thank you. Yep. It took me a second to get my head right. So on the index page, we're going to go and make a message as well. That's going to catch that temp data, right? Yep. And then here, maybe we'll have some, uh, we'll just stick it at the top of the, top of the form for now. And we'll say uh, maybe an H3. And some sort of message? E model dot message. Okay. Okay. So it'd be empty. And, you know, maybe we'd want to hide it if it wasn't there or whatever. There's lots of lots of things that we could potentially do. But for now, this I think will be fine. But this is just an example where it's not quite database stuff. It doesn't want you don't want to stick it in the database temporarily. You just want it to be somewhere temporarily. Some sort of acknowledgement for the user. Mm -hmm. Yep. And the general idea of being able to. There you go. There you are. And that could look at whatever you want. You could do whatever you want. It could, uh, it could uh, fade in with jQuery or, or animation or whatever makes you happy. And that's different from there, which is your default state, right? So we'll do it again. Okay. And it's because it was called temp data, and we had have the same name here and where it started. So it, it, it found its way magically over into uh, the index area as well, which is pretty sweet. Cool. Cool. All right. Now, we talked a little bit about logging very, very briefly. But we didn't really do anything with it. When but we, we saw it this. up here. We saw it there. We mm -hmm. saw two different kinds of logging. We saw this one, and then we saw a little bit more there. So there was warning, and then there was... Oops, pardon me. There was, yeah, there you go. There's warning, and then there's debug. Okay. And then you can have different subsections. You can say, well, I, I just want information from Microsoft, but I want debug from everybody else. Right? Yep. So let's go see if we can figure out how to do logging. All right, so we'll go back over to here. And I'm going to try to remember how to do this from scratch. Do you, Hannah? Can you tell me how? You, you, you got to try to remember? Well, you know, I just want to do it right, but I don't want to, you know, I don't have all this stuff in my head all the time. So I should be iLogger. <laughs> Is it I? <laughs> you probably need to add it as a service. Yeah, so I okay. add it as a service. And then you have to, then we have to use it. Yeah. So there's add logging. And then we've got app dot. I don't think it's used. Do you know? Do you put it up? Uh, so, iLogger. Yeah, I think it's iLogger. I think it's yeah. See? Yes, you have to add the extension. It comes out of an extension. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's good. Guesswork makes for the best work. Yeah, there you go. Okay. Then we'll say, "Hey, Logger Factory." And you can say, well, if I'm running it at the console, I could add the console. Because you can log to all kinds of places, right? You can log to files. You can log it into Application Insights. Yeah. Do all kinds of things. And if you go and do Application Insights, that's going to ask you all kinds of questions as well. Right now, for now, I'm going to add console. I'm going to add debug. OK. Now. Do you need the first one anymore? Uh, the console one. Uh, is if I'm running it from the command line, and if I ever want to, I think I'd like to have that. that option. Okay, so it's a choice. Well, so it's a, it's a, I'd, I, I'm going to be doing stuff, or someone on my team works in the console, and I'd like to be able to spit out to the console when possible. So what I'm trying to point out is that you don't need both of them, right? Um, they don't. No, one. It, I'm pointing the debug. I'm pointing the logging to multiple locations. Okay. I could point it out to App Insights. I could put it in a text file. I could put it in a database. It would be weird. <laughs> but I could do that. Yeah. So right now I'm putting it, I'm sending consoling, I'm two. sending logging to two places. Right? Okay. Pardon me. Yeah. So yeah, it's cool to do that. Um, and then in a place that I might want to use it, remember how we put everything on one line there before? Yeah. 
we're going to take it out. And I think I would say private i logger. And I think it would be of type create model. And I'll just say log. And then we say i logger create model log. And then again, we scroll it away. Now here I am mixing things. Here this person went underscore db and I said capital L. You should pick a pick a style. So so is it. the underscore really just a style? It's just a style. It's like saying this is private or it's read only or it's internal. There's lots of people have different styles. Um, you tend to use capitals for publics. Yeah. There is a there was a time when we used to say m underscore for secret member, you know. Now sometimes people put underscore for internal or read only. I'm just uh, I should be more responsible in the way I name my things. Yes, you should. I should. It's sad. Okay. This string right here I could maybe reuse. And then make it for log okay. And I could say log level? Yeah, I could say log information, log debug, log critical. Let's say that that's critical. It's totally not critical. But I could say that's a bad thing. Oh my goodness. Customer added, right? <laughs> and then it might come out red, right? And actually, that would be cool to try. So if I am a web application, and where is my web application? It is down here. So let's go over to that location. Yeah. And I'll try .NET run from the command line. This is a good reminder that you can do these things in Visual Studio, or you can jump back out into uh, the command line. That's cool, too. So it's giving you? 6405. Oops. So I'll put that there, and I'll put this here. Oh, oh there it was. Critical. Ah. Right? That's right. the console one. So the idea there is that that information could go to lots of different places. So let's close that up. We're going to see it in the debug. And let's do, oops, and let's go and do it in um, Application Insights. Okay. Which is cool. And you can see it in the debugger as well, right? You can, the point is that, that that stream of information is going out into the world. It can go out into the command line. It can go out into a window. It can go into Windows debug, text file. Totally up to you. All right. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to declare tab bankruptcy. This is too much. It's stressing me out. Okay. Go back over here. I'm going to right click. And I'm going to say add application insights. Okay. And you've done this before many sure times. Have. Here's the trick, though. You can do this and sign up in Azure. You can use it for free. You get like what a gigabyte of it's space, something like that. They'll go and register your app, and you can, even though you're running your app locally, send the telemetry up into the cloud. We'll do this a bit a little bit later. Okay. But I want to point out to people that you don't have to do it that way, OK? They, they would like you to sign up, and I think that you would get value if you signed up. But you can also try it local only. OK. It's a little subtle. You can try it local only, which means none of your data will be sent up into the cloud. But is this, it's a data that you can export and put somewhere else. Like, you can send a report to someone. Sure. Um, the point is that the cloud is going to give you a lot more uh, a lot more insight. It's going to apply all the analytics, and you have a, kind of an unlimited amount of space in the cloud. Uh, I think it's a gig for free, and then beyond that, you can do all kinds of things in the cloud you can't do locally. Oh yeah. I, but the point I'm making is that there's no reason not to try it out locally. You can do amazing stuff with it, even on an airplane. You know what I mean? So let's go and run this. And you just added the app insights. Um... Yeah, by, that's a good point. By running that, I just added that package. Yep. And it, it plugged itself into the, um, the pipeline. OK. Oh, so you didn't have to manually add it into your no, pipeline didn't at all. So anything. it's automatically added by default? Yeah, it's magic. I think, I think we can actually look at the, 
Let's go out to where that was. Where is that file located? The CS proj is here, and we can open it up. There it is. There it? Okay. So it's just a package, and once it gets in there, it's plugged into the, the pipeline, and it's going to collect all kinds of stuff. But now I can go and really uh, query my application. So it's running right now, Okay. to be clear. Let's go and do our creates and stuff. And I'll come in here. And I'll say, look, see the numbers going, getting oh, yeah. higher? Well, let me do that again. So add a new one. Yeah, yeah. OK. So, so events are happening. So I can click on that. And this is what you want to get. This is sweet. I can see the number of requests, the number of traces. You can filter it? You can, yeah, you can filter by just show me creates. Just show me people on this version. Just show me people on Chrome. Just show me people on Firefox. Just show me, just show me things that took longer than a second, right? You can go through this whole list here, and I could look for it. Look. And then it has these really good icons so you know oh, what's yeah, yeah. what. Yeah. See, remember how we made adding a customer a critical? Yeah. So I can double click on that individual trace. Okay? So then we can see the name of the computer. Oh, and the see, operation? The severity, the operations, and I can use, then show me all telemetry for this user. So then you could say, well, I'm, uh, I've got a bunch of users hitting this. This is where the local stuff will fall down at some point, and then you're going to want to go into the cloud. But one of the great options is something's occurred. Yeah. Beyonce has been added. Show me telemetry five minutes before and after. Okay. Right, because the bug might not be near her; it might be, be around her, around her elsewhere on the elevator. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Then I can go and chart these things over time. Again, this is all local. This is the stuff you get locally. And then when you want to go beyond that, there's all kinds of great stuff in the Application Insights portal. And this would link you right. Link you right there, and you can go and check it out. And we will explore a bunch of that stuff uh, in another um, in another talk. See. Here, when you sign in, you can pick your resource and then see uh, dependencies, how your application talks to the database, calls another web API, stuff you wouldn't be able to do if you didn't put it in the cloud. And here I've just added a filter, and I've said create. I can turn that filter off. Just show me the longest ones. Filter on those. There's the record. There you go. One of the requests took a long time. Click on that. That was the initial get. Okay. The very first time it compiled that uh, that page, not that fantastic. That is fantastic. Yeah, That's I really pretty like. Impressive. I really like Application Insights. Cool. Okay. So I think that puts us in a pretty good spot, doesn't it? We've yeah. got a nice little CRUD application, basic Bootstrap. It's talking to Application Insights. We've got logging. I think that's a pretty good beginner start, wouldn't you say? Yeah, we've, we've, we've accomplished quite a bit over the past couple of hours. Where should they go now? The docs. The docs. Go to the docs. Go to docs.microsoft.com, get started. Great samples, great interactive experiences. And if you see this, send Hanselman an applause. So just, yeah, say applause to us on, on Twitter, <laughs> on myself Twitter. and uh, and Maria, As and be sure to explore all the different great courses yeah. that are here at Microsoft Virtual Academy. This is just beginner ASP.NET Core. We've got uh, beginner C Sharp. We've got all sorts of great uh, cloud-based content. There's an intermediate and advanced. There's yep. Docker, and on and on and on. Thank you so much for spending your day with us here on Microsoft Virtual Academy.